Deborah Deese. Here. Um, can you put yourself on mute if you're not um, speaking or responding to roll call, please? Deborah Deese. Here. Anne Marie Dulege. Here. Isabel Dudon. Here. Mark Fisher Colbury. Mark, I saw you on the line. I think I see you there. You're on mute. I will come back to you. Elena Flowers. Judy Gasson. Here. Larry Goldstein. Here. David Higgins. Here. Steve Julesgard. Present. Joseph Kim. Here. Pat Levitt. Here. Linda Malkus. Here. Dave Martin. Here. Shlomo Here. Mohamed. Here. Christine Muskowski. Morning. Lauren Miller Rogan. Here. Adriana Padilla. Here. Joe Panetta. Here. Al Roulette. Al. Here. Thank you. Michael Stamos. Here. Uh, Stewart. Here. Jonathan Thomas. Here. Art Torres. Here. Christina Vori. Here. Carol Watson. Here. Keith Yamamoto. And I missed one, Fred Fisher. And Thank Mark you. Fisher Corbett's here too. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Good Very forum, JT. Thank you. Was uh, was Fred on? I couldn't hear there. Fred's not on yet this morning. He um, he thought he might be late. Okay. And Leandra is on? Yes, she is. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll proceed first to the, if you actually, you can hold on one second. I, I need to get one thing. The Check, by the way, folks, my, my internet is having some issues, so I hope that uh, it's not going to be problematic. Uh, tried to find the place in the house here that works the best, but if you can bear with me for one second. Well, if it doesn't work, that's why you have a vice chair. That's absolutely correct, which is why I'm mentioning this, Art, I, <laughs> just in case, because we've been having some real issues starting last night. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear uh, But I will be right back. Give me one second here. Sorry. Thank you for bearing with me. I just needed to check one thing here. Okay, so uh, the first order of the day is uh, we need uh, Adriana Padilla uh, has been reappointed and we need to swear her in for her next term. So Adriana, if you could raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. Hi, Adriana. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any <laughs> mental, mental reservation, reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And I will well and faithfully discharge. 
the duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations and welcome back. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to the chair's report, which will sort of be broken down into three parts. Uh, number one, uh, we're going to ask the new members who are online here to briefly introduce themselves as is our historical precedent. Uh, number two, uh, we will do a quick recap of where the board has been since the passage of Prop 14. And number three, we will talk about and laud our five recently departed board members, uh, departed as in leaving the board, mind you, uh, and, uh, and have some comments about them. So uh, first of all, uh, Leandra, uh, if you could just uh, introduce yourself briefly to the board, please. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. I'm Dr. Leandra Clark Harvey. I'm a psychologist by trade who made a transition several years ago to a uh, professional advocate. So I worked in the state capitol. I've worked in both the Senate and Assembly um, and leadership positions and then had the opportunity to um, be the CEO of the California Council of Community Behavioral Health Agencies. We call it CBHA for short. Um, representing mental health and substance use disorder clinics across the state. So I've been doing that for the past four years. Really honored to be in that position and bring my experience um, as an advocate and as a psychologist to bear and I'm really thrilled about this appointment. Uh, so that's a little bit about me professionally. Personally, I'm a mom of two little boys uh, working from home, as you can see, during this pandemic uh, with toddlers. So just trying to hang in there and grow, getting a gray hair in honor of one of my children or the other every day. Thank you, Leandra. Uh, Maria, is Fred on yet or still not on at this point? He's not on. Um, so um, I would, he will join later in the meeting, hopefully. Okay. So that okay. we can uh, talk about, have him talk. Great. So uh, next we've got a uh, Joseph Kim, who's our alternate for Dr. Abdul Haq uh, at UCSF Fresno. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, Dr. Armas, thank you. It's uh, great to be here and, and see everybody um, filling in for Dr. Abdul, Dr. Abdul Haq. Uh, I'm an assistant professor here at UCSF Fresno in infectious diseases, um, so teach in our fellowship program. Uh, also have a background in immunology research, uh, transplant immunology. Um, and I'm uh, very excited to, to participate. A um, little bit of personal information about myself. I'm a California guy. I grew up in Los Angeles um, and right now enjoying the Fresno heat. It's about 110 degrees right now, <laughs> or it's going to be 110 degrees today. Thank you. Uh, and then when, uh, when Fred Fisher joins uh, later on in the meeting, we'll have him introduce himself as well. He's uh, the, the new patient advocate for ALS and MS. Uh, replacing Diane Winokur. So uh, briefly, just to recap, uh, this has been a, a, a bit of a whirlwind period for uh, all members of the CIRM family since the passage of Prop 14 in November of last year, uh, which as we know, uh, re-upped the agency uh, with an additional five and a half billion dollars to spend, uh, which uh, the team and the board have readily uh, been about uh, working on how best to deploy that amount. And all of which of course has taken place in the context of the continuing pandemic. Uh, when we, the board geared up again in December, of course, uh, this was pre-vaccine availability. Uh, a lot has changed over the course of the last few months, thankfully. Uh, particularly here in California, uh, but uh, everything over the course of the last eight months has been uh, virtual uh, and uh, has actually worked uh, very well from the board perspective as it's uh, enabled uh, more members to join regularly to our, our calls and has been, uh, from my perspective, a very productive time. Uh, we just to go back uh, over a bit of what we've done in the last several months. Uh, in December, we had our first big board meeting following the election uh, at which uh, we 
uh, among other things, uh, set a new budget for uh, the balance of the fiscal year. As you recall, we had prior to that had a wind down budget, which was uh, considerably uh, less uh, money available than we uh, have now under the new proposition. So we needed to recast what we were going to do over the next six months. Uh, and that in that budget, as you recall, it contemplated uh, restarting uh, a number of our core programs, particularly all of the, uh, the science programs, the discovery, translational and clinical. Uh, we anticipated in addition, because we had cut the, the team down uh, considerably as we were in potential wind down mode, we uh, resolved at the December meeting to add uh, up to 10 new members of the team between then and the end of the fiscal year, which is coming up on June 30. Uh, and the uh, very happy and very impressed to report that the, the team did a, an incredible job in recruiting world-class folks for a number of different positions here, uh, led by Dr. Milan and by uh, Maria Bonneville. And uh, we've gotten, uh, a number of those in place. I think Maria is now eight of the 10, is that correct? Um, uh, Maria will be covering this in her report, but it's, okay. Um, we had... Okay, thank you. Uh, in any event, uh, that, that has been a, a great success and uh, further added to uh, our, our already stellar team going forward. The, uh, the measure, as you know, uh, added six new board members to the mix, uh, two new patient advocates in mental health, two nurses and two representatives from the UC, one from UC Riverside and one from UCSF Fresno. Uh, the, uh, the, the budget plans that we adopted uh, both contemplated uh, increased spending in admin as well as uh, our legacy programs. Uh, and, uh, and, and that has, of course, as we've gone on, uh, been implemented over the last six months. Uh, one of the things that uh, immediately uh, was the subject matter of great discussion uh, back in December and ever since has been uh, increasing attention in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, both with respect to our uh, our the grants that we give, and uh, as well as the teams that are presenting those grants, and that effort has uh, led to the uh, the uh, amending of a number of our concept plans to factor in this uh, increased emphasis, uh, and that work uh, is going to be something that will continue over time. Uh, importantly, there's been a lot of discussion on how to factor in DEI into the GWG deliberations and recommendations, uh, and that work uh, is uh, something that is, uh, continues to be in progress and is going to be refined until uh, we have things fully implemented. Uh, in January, you recall, we had uh, James presented an in-depth review of Proposition 14, which uh, has in it a number of new elements that we've talked about uh, fairly exhaustively, ranging from the billion and a half allocated specifically to diseases of the brain, uh, to expanded alpha clinics, uh, plus uh, the advent of uh, there are satellites, the so-called community care centers of excellence. Uh, we have uh, had uh, re-upping of the training and shared lab award concepts. Uh, we have, uh, have had the a provision allowing for the establishment of advisory panels to the chair and the CEO. Uh, we've had uh, a number of different elements in there about working groups, most notably a very important new working group, the Accessibility and Affordability Working Group, uh, which is chaired by Senator Torres, uh, which is going to be dealing with the, uh, the very important issues of how to make uh, 
treatments and cures that arise from our grants available to all citizens of California, particularly in underserved areas at affordable prices. Uh, that particular working group is going to have, uh, as you know, five board members, which we named early in the year, uh, as well as up to 15 new members of the CERM team to support that effort. Uh, and that will be something that's going to be getting uh, increasing attention as time goes by. Uh, Senator Torres and I and uh, Maria Bonneville have uh, been busy uh, looking for candidates for the, uh, the uh, in addition to the five board members, there are 10 slots of experts that bring different perspectives to the table. Uh, and that process of naming those 10 is something that's taken a fair bit of time. We have eight of the 10 identified now uh, and are close to filling out the other two, at which point that working group is going to be holding its first meeting and discussing scope of work, proposed budgets, all that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, after the, the January meeting where we had all the discussion on uh, that uh, new measure, we went in February to, uh, among other things, uh, the first of our advisory panels, which was the science, uh, Scientific Strategic Advisory Panel, so-called SSAP, which Dr. Milan and I uh, put together, uh, which, uh, which was comprised, as you will recall, of 14 world experts in the field of regenerative medicine to take stock of the new measure and to hear presentations from a number of our folks up and down the state who are running uh, different projects and programs, uh, all towards spurring discussion on how the new measure could be used uh, and, and programs either established or improved or whatever as part of a year long process that Dr. Milan is running to develop the new strategic plan for CIRM, uh, which plan is going to be finalized this December. Uh, in the intervening months since then, the board has, uh, has seen the, uh, the launching of our core programs. We had our first GWG meeting in March for uh, the clinical awards and uh, as before have had uh, GWG meetings on a monthly basis since then to continue those. We've had uh, the relaunching of our educational programs which uh, include uh, Bridges and Spark uh, and importantly, uh, the new, the revitalized training grants, uh, and that has gotten a, a great deal of attention. Uh, we uh, subsequently have had the uh, a new budget developed for fiscal 21-22, uh, which you will see uh, discussed further in the meeting today both again on the science side and the administrative side uh, and have uh, are fully prepared now to launch into the next fiscal year with uh, our programs largely uh, re-upped at this point. Uh, and uh, we will see a full complement on the science side in addition to CLIN, uh, we had our first TRAN GWG, the board authorized awards from that, and we'll be coming up on first discovery GWG and authorization of those awards going forward. Uh, we've had uh, also, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Milan will be referencing this, uh, the, the team in addition to putting together the strategic, scientific strategic advisory panel had a uh, a, an excellent workshop uh, led by Dr. Patel uh, and uh, Dr. Talib on uh, manufacturing issues, uh, and, uh, and that has set the table for a lot of consideration on how we move forward on this most important element. Uh, so that sort of brings you up to date. Uh, the, the, the board has, uh, as you know, in an ordinary course, would be having uh, 
quarterly meetings uh, because of the fact that there's been so much going on, so many things that needed to be discussed. We've had uh, at least a meeting a month since December and some months too. Uh, that will be uh, returning to normal more as we get into the second half of the year. Uh, but it has been a, a very busy time, uh, to say the least, uh, and the, uh, the team has uh, accomplished a huge amount and want to give uh, very significant congratulations to Dr. Milan and uh, all of the team for uh, being able to mobilize and, and put together uh, all of the discussions, the programs, uh, the workshops, the reviews, et cetera, uh, in a, a very condensed fashion, uh, all of which has left us in a, a very good spot going forward. Uh, just uh, very briefly uh, coming up, uh, there, we're going to see, uh, the board will be hearing more about the our ongoing refinements to the DEI policy uh, that will be the subject for a GWG consideration, as I mentioned. Uh, starting with uh, how that will be additionally factored in on the CLIN awards and ultimately the TRAN and DISC. Uh, in the October meeting, which is our next regularly scheduled meeting, we're going to be uh, having a concept proposal uh, for, for improvements in the discovery program, as well as a new undergraduate education program initiative uh, which uh, shout out to Dr. Goldstein for his recommending that uh, as an, uh, an addition to our, uh, our educational programs that we already have in place. Uh, the board is going to be uh, uh, welcome to a stakeholders town hall, which is going to, I'm sure Dr. Milan will talk about, uh, which is going to take place at the end of this month on the 29th. Uh, as well as roundtables on uh, neurological genomics uh, and data sharing issues later in the year. The draft strategic plan is going to be brought to the board for consideration at the October board meeting. Uh, and the final strategic plan uh, based on that and the revised budget will be brought to the board in December of this year, which will be our last regularly scheduled event for 2021. So that gives you a, a feel for where we've come, where we are and where we're going. Uh, and with that, uh, that I will now move on to uh, a portion of the meeting that is always a bittersweet one uh, because it has to do with uh, thanking our, uh, our board members who have served for many years that uh, were termed out and have had to step down. Uh, and, uh, and when we do that, we always have uh, resolutions that we read. Uh, and for those uh, of, of the, uh, the honorees, if you will, that are uh, in attendance here will have some comments made on their behalf and then ask them to make some comments. So uh, our first, uh, we have, I believe, uh, Francisco and Jeff are both uh, on, on the call here. Uh, our other three are not, uh, but I will nonetheless read their bios because these are people who have all been involved for many years with the board and I think it's important particularly for the new members who may not be familiar with uh, these uh, very important board members uh, you hear about them and their contributions. So our first is Dr. David Brenner uh, who joined the board in 2007. And uh, if you'll just indulge me, uh, each of these has a number of whereases, but I, I, I do want to read them as they are very important. So, whereas David Brenner earned his Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Yale College and a doctorate in medicine from Yale Medical School, whereas Dr. Brenner conducted his residency at Yale New Haven Medical Center in internal medicine from 1979 to 1982, 
whereas Dr. Brenner served as a research associate in the genetics and biochemistry branch of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases at the NIH from 1982 to 1985, whereas Dr. Brenner served as a gastroenterology fellow at the University of California, San Diego from 1985 to 1986, whereas Dr. Brenner served as an assistant professor of medicine in residence at the University of California, San Diego from 1986 to 1990, and then as an associate professor from 1990 to 1992, whereas Dr. Brenner served in several capacities at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in San Diego, California, including staff physician, acting assistant chief of medicine, and clinical investigator from 1987 to 1992. Dr. Brenner served as a professor of medicine and biochemistry and biophysics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from 1993 to 2003 whereas Dr. Brenner is a preeminent scholar in the field of gastroenterology. Dr. Brenner served as the editor-in-chief of gastroenterology, the, the periodical from 2001 to 2006, whereas Dr. Brenner served as the Samuel Bard Professor and Chairman of the Department of Medicine at Columbia University from 2003 to 2007, Whereas beginning in 2007, Dr. Brenner began his tenure as the Vice Chancellor for Health Services and Dean at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine and Distinguished Professor of Medicine. In this capacity, he leads the UC San Diego School of Medicine, the SCAG School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at University of California, San Diego and UC San Diego Health. Whereas beginning in 2007, Dr. Brenner began his exemplary service on the ICOC. Whereas Dr. Brenner through his experience, commitment, knowledge and leadership contributed greatly to the momentum of discovery in the future therapies, which will be the ultimate outcome of the dedicated work of the researchers receiving CERM funding. Be it resolved that the governing board of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine on behalf of the people of the state of California wishes to express its deepest gratitude to Dr. David Brenner for his service on CIRM's governing board and for his dedication to the advancement of stem cell research and to the mission of CIRM to accelerate stem cell treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. So that is the resolution to Dr. Brenner. By the way, uh, all of these are uh, going to be uh, voted on by the board. This is an action item uh, and will be framed and uh, provided to each of our members. Next, uh, we have uh, Francisco Prieto. So Francisco, bear with me as we recite all of your many accomplishments. Whereas Francisco Prieto received his Bachelor of Science majoring in biology and history from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Whereas Dr. Prieto received his doctorate in medicine from the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. Whereas Dr. Prieto completed a residency in family medicine at the University of Arizona. Whereas Dr. Prieto served as the associate clinical professor at the University of Arizona. Whereas Dr. Prieto served for three years in the National Health Service Corps. Whereas Dr. Prieto has served as a family medicine physician in Sacramento since 1986. Whereas Dr. Prieto has served as an associate clinical professor at the University of California, Davis Department of Family Practice since 1986. Whereas Dr. Prieto has served as a family medicine physician with Sutter Medical Group in Elk Grove since 1997. Whereas Dr. Prieto is a diabetes research expert serving at the Sutter Institute for Medical Research. Whereas Dr. Prieto has been a patient advocate for diabetes care and education. Whereas Dr. Prieto is the former president of the Sacramento Sierra chapter of the American Diabetes Association. Whereas Dr. Prieto chaired the American Diabetes Association's Professional Education Committee and Committee for Tour de Cure, the American Diabetes Association's annual bicycling event. 
whereas Dr. Prieto is a member of the American Diabetes Association's National Advocacy Committee and the Latino Diabetes Action Council, whereas Dr. Prieto was a founding director of CIRM, helping establish the agency's foundational procedures and policies, whereas Dr. Prieto has served in numerous leadership roles while on CIRM's governing board, including as chair of the evaluation subcommittee, and whereas Dr. Pietro, through his experience, commitment, knowledge, and leadership, contributed greatly to the momentum of discovery and the future therapies, which will be the ultimate outcome <coughs> of the dedicated work of the researchers receiving CIRM funding, be it resolved that the governing board of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine on the people of the people of the state of California wishes to express its deepest gratitude to Dr. Francisco Prieto for his service on CIRM's governing board and for his dedication to the advancement of stem cell research and to the mission of CIRM to accelerate stem cell treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. Francisco, uh, I believe uh, Al Roulette has uh, some comments you would like to make on your behalf and then please, uh, if you would please say a few comments yourself. That would be great. Al. Thank you, JT, and uh, hello, Francisco. Um, Francisco, uh, at great cost to, to an embarrass, potential embarrassment to me, I'm gonna give you a quiz. So are you ready? Huffy, Cannondale, or Bianchi? Which do you pick? Uh, Bianchi. Ah, absolutely right. And what members of the board may not know is that Francisco Prieto is also an avid biker. Uh, I met Francisco Prieto early on in my career uh, as a member of the ICOC. We were commuting back and forth from Sacramento to uh, board meetings. And I had the unique privilege of getting to know him and to know him is to appreciate and understand his passion for the community that he represents. Francisco is the consummate advocate for the underserved and the unserved. He is a person with integrity, a person with a high standard, and an individual who understands the importance of making sure that board members get the proper orientation and onboarding, which he helped afford me. Without his advocacy and support early on, and also the advocacy and support uh, of uh, other patient advocates, but particularly during those rides up to the board meetings, Francisco provided me with a unique perspective on what it meant to advocate uh, as a member of the ICOC. He was transparent, he worked with integrity, and he was always, 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 always willing to provide me with some advice on what bicycle I should ride. Thank you, Francisco, for helping me ride the ICOC patient advocate bicycle. And I commit to you that I will continue to support and represent the unserved and underserved members uh, of the state of California who would be, uh, ben who will benefit from the advocacy and the cures that come out of our organization. Thank you very much, Francisco. Thank you, Al, on behalf of the board. Uh, Francisco, would you please say a few words? I had my hand up. Oh, I it's, couldn't see that, Art. It's a little art, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I just want to say that Francisco never recommended a bicycle. He just took all my money for every diabetes bike ride, which I was more than willing to give in terms of his charity and in terms of his commitment. But he's well known in Sacramento and his leadership is well known and also his advocacy for diabetes and diabetes patients. Uh, he comes from a long history of, of medicine, stemming from Chicago all the way to California. So his family has always been very much involved in medical care and clearly in terms of looking after patients. But more than that, he is just a stand up person who will always be there when you need his advice or his help without question. So continued great diabetes bicycle rides, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Art. Uh, Francisco. Thank you. Um, wow. Uh, 
And and thank you, Al and Art. Um, Al, I, I, I hadn't really prepared anything. I didn't realize you were going to ask us to say anything. But um, Al, I, I, I do want to say, you know, right back at you. And I really um, appreciate at the time you joined the ICOC, we were going through a particularly difficult issue um, that I'm sure you recall. And you really cut through the, the clutter and all the sort of not quite central issues to the key that we had to deal with. And that helped us come to a, a, a successful resolution of what could have been a, a much more serious problem. So I, I am eternally grateful to you for that. And I'm, I'm grateful to CIRM for this opportunity because this has really been one of the most exciting episodes of my life. Um, an opportunity to not just advocate for patients, but for science and to hopefully push the ball forward and, and improve the kind of treatments that our patients will see in the future. Um, I sometimes tell my colleagues that this has given me a glimpse into how different medicine will be in another generation or two, and that it will make what we do every day kind of look like bloodletting and leeches, although leeches still have their place. Um, but I, I want to thank you all for that. And uh, it's been a great ride. Thanks. Great ride. No pun intended. Yeah. Thank you very much, Francisco. Uh, we, we echo everything that has been said. Uh, as you, you were one of the, the, the founding board members uh, and been here since the very beginning, your role has been utterly instrumental in guiding the agency as it has progressed to where it is today. So on behalf of the board, thank you very much. Uh, Okay, we're going to go on to our third resolution, which is for Dr. Robert Quint, uh, who is not on the call today, I don't believe, uh, but I will, as before, read his resolution so everybody can appreciate his contributions as well. Whereas Dr. Robert Quint received his Bachelor of Science majoring in biology from the University of Notre Dame, Whereas Dr. Quint received his doctorate in medicine from Ohio State University School of Medicine. Whereas Dr. Quint completed his internship and residency at the University of Texas Medical Branch, John Seeley Hospital. <clears throat> Whereas Dr. Quint completed two fellowships in internal medicine and invasive cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Whereas Dr. Quint began his history of public service in the military, working as a cardiologist and internist at the Valley Forge Hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Whereas Dr. Quint served as a member of the U.S. Army Medical Corps as an internist and cardiologist at the 8th Field Hospital in Nha Trang, Vietnam. Whereas Dr. Quint has specialized in cardiology since 1971. Whereas Dr. Quint has written articles for such publications as the American Journal of Cardiology and the Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery. Whereas for 14 years, Dr. Quint served as a clinical instructor on the voluntary clinical faculty at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Whereas Dr. Quint has presented and lectured on medicine in Iran, Sri Lanka, and Japan. Whereas Dr. Quint holds a staff appointment at the O'Connor Hospital in San Jose. Whereas over Dr. Quint's 25 year tenure at O'Connor Hospital, he has been director of the Department of Cardiology and Vascular Services and a member of the Cardiovascular Quality Assurance Committee. Whereas Dr. Quint is a charter member and founding fellow of the Society of Cardiac Angiography and Interventions and the uh, which is the SCAI, and the SCAI's Credentials Committee, whereas Dr. Quint serves on the American Heart Association's Scientific Council and the Association's Council on Atherosclerosis, whereas Dr. Quint serves as a member of the Medical Advisory Board of the SciMed Life Systems, Inc., the United States Congressional Advisory Board, and the American Professional Practice Association, whereas beginning in 2008, Dr. Quint served as a director at CIRM, helping establish crucial agency procedures and policies and advocating for patients suffering from heart disease. 
And whereas Dr. Quint, through his experience, commitment, knowledge, and leadership, contributed greatly to the momentum of discovery and the future therapies, which will be the ultimate outcome of the dedicated work of the researchers receiving CERN funding, be it resolved that the governing board of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, on behalf of the people of the state of California, wishes to express its deepest gratitude to Dr. Robert Quint for his service on CERM's governing board and for his dedication to the advancement of stem cell research and to the mission of CERM to accelerate stem cell treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. Dr. Quint. Next, we go to Jeff Sheehy, who, as all of you know, uh, along with Francisco, was as well one of our founding board members and long-standing patient advocate. Whereas Jeff Sheehy earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of Texas at Austin, whereas Mr. Sheehy served as a victim's rights advocate in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office from 1998 to 2000, Whereas Mr. Sheehy served as an HIV AIDS policy advisor to then San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom from 2004 to 2006. Whereas Mr. Sheehy served as communications director for the UCSF AIDS Institute where he led media relations for hundreds of AIDS research institute scientists and interpreted and disseminated crucial research findings. Whereas Mr. Sheehy's advocacy on behalf of patients and HIV AIDS spans over two decades, during which time he advanced policies and legislation that vastly improved the quality of life for thousands of individuals living with HIV AIDS. Whereas in recognition of his HIV AIDS advocacy, Mr. Sheehy has received numerous awards, including the Human Rights Campaign's Leadership Award, the Cape Crusader Award from Equality California, the Tomas Fabregas AIDS Hero Award, and the UCSF Chancellor's Award for Public Service. Whereas Mr. Xi is a crusader for the LGBTQ equality, serving as the president of the Harvey Milk LGBT Democratic Club and a key member of, of ACT UP San Francisco, Whereas Mr. Sheehy was a crucial advocate in San Francisco's landmark Equal Benefits Ordinance, a law that advanced LGBT protections in the city and county of San Francisco. Whereas Mr. Sheehy was appointed to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors by Mayor Ed Lee in 2017. Whereas as supervisor, Mr. Sheehy made history by serving as the first openly HIV positive supervisor in San Francisco. Whereas Mr. Sheehy was a founding director of CIRM, establishing the agency's foundational procedures and policies. Whereas Mr. Sheehy served as chair of the ICOC's science subcommittee, vice chair of the grants working group, a member of the scientific and medical accountability standards working committee, a member of the scientific and medical facilities working groups, a member of the industry engagement and intellectual property subcommittee, a member of the governance subcommittee, a member of the legislative subcommittee, a member of the evaluation subcommittee, and a member of the finance subcommittee. Whereas Mr. Sheehy played a crucial role developing CIRM's intellectual property regulations and ethical standards, and whereas Mr. Sheehy, through his experience, commitment, knowledge, and leadership, contributed greatly to the momentum of discovery and the future therapies, which will be the ultimate outcome of the dedicated work of the researchers receiving CERM funding. Be it resolved that the governing board of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine on behalf of the people of the state of California wishes to express its deepest gratitude to Jeff Sheehy for his service on CERM's governing board and for his dedication to the advancement of stem cell research and to the mission of CERM to accelerate stem cell treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. I believe that's quite, uh, quite a list uh, as are uh, all of these. Uh, uh, I believe uh, Oz, you have some comments on Jeff's behalf. Yeah. Uh, uh... <laughs> So, Jeff, wow. And uh, honestly, I just have to say to both uh, Jeff and Francisco, uh, what a ride. Um, you know, it's been, it's been just incredible 
serving with both of you. Um, uh, Jeff, um, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to, I'm the designated commenter for you, but, um, uh, you know, I just wanted to say that for, uh, for you're both, you know, I just love you both. It, you're such wonderful people and um, you've done such an incredible amount of work for CIRM. So thank you. Um, it's been an honor to serve for both of you. Um, yeah, you know, Jeff, uh, I'm going to concentrate on you. I don't think there's anybody on CERM uh, <clears throat> who has dedicated more time, who's been involved in more things, who has served uh, with such an incredible, uh, thoughtful, um, uh, active uh, role in everything that's gone on. Um, you, you are the one who always, always, always stands up for the, um, the right thing, uh, doing things not only for the patients, the patients are always first, but also in terms of the science, the science is the, our guiding force. But third, you're the person who really invariably stood up and said, wait a minute, we are a uh, state agency. Uh, we are a governing board that uh, is responsible for spending the money of the citizens of the state of California who have entrusted those funds to us. And you always expressed such an honorable responsibility to that role, making sure that we were always paying attention to the fact that we were basically in service of the citizens of our state. Um, I, I've learned a lot from you in terms of both uh, the, the thoughtfulness of, uh, of which you uh, dedicate your life to promoting a cause, an, an incredibly important cause, and uh, your thoughtfulness in essentially all regards. Um, again, it's been just a huge pleasure serving with you. Uh, you know, I'm the last one, the last one standing of the of the uh, original <laughs> uh, of the original patient advocates. Um, and I will soon be riding off into the sunset with all of you. Actually, I suspect very soon. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, Francisco. And um, wow, again, all I can say is what a ride and what a pleasure to work with, uh, with both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Oz. Uh, Jeff, could you give a few comments, please? Oh, sorry, Al's got his hand up. I just, I did just see, sorry, before Jeff, Al, please. Uh, Jeff, I wanted to acknowledge that you are the consummate uh, protagonist. Uh, you are the ideal advocate uh, and provided me with a perspective that was unique and important uh, and helped me in my trajectory as a board member. So I wanted to take a moment and say thank you very much. Thanks, Al. Uh, Jeff, could you please make some comments. Sure, um, thank you, JT, and it's great to see you, and it's great to see everybody, and uh, thank you so much, Al, and, uh, and Oz, and Francisco. Um, the, those kind words, uh, it's just a little overwhelming to hear all of these kudos, and uh, it really has been an incredible uh, experience. Um, you know, um, I, I do have to, of course, there's going to be a little bit of an admonition here. Uh, I've been struck, and I, I apologize, but uh, for not just going into like kudo land. But, you know, the last couple of weeks, about a week ago, we marked the 40th anniversary, which is a weird thing to call an anniversary of the first cases of AIDS in the country. And, uh, UCSF asked me for some reflections on that. And I have to say, I was really struck, overwhelmed, and frankly, shamed that despite the incredible progress we've made against HIV and AIDS, the therapies we have that can prevent the disease from being transmitted. If you take the pills every day, you cannot infect another person. If you get access to 
a medication, you cannot. You're like 98% protected from getting infected. So we had the tools to end the epidemic, but then we look at where we are and who's impacted and our black and brown communities suffer disproportionately from the burden of HIV and AIDS. And then you look at our recent and our ongoing experience with COVID and the statistics are the same. And you, you know, I've spent my life, a big part of my life, uh, so much of my life has been divide, defined by HIV. Um, I just cannot believe that, I just overwhelmed by a sense of failure that, that these kinds of health disparities exist and continue to exist. And I love the work of CIRM. I think the agency has done tremendous work. I am, so, you know, I was so heartened by your remarks, uh, JT, the, the, the new focus on health equity, but for all of us as, as, as Californians, as Americans, um, we really have to look inside ourselves and look at our priorities and, and, and recognize that, especially in healthcare, we're just not sharing equally. We just don't seem to care about everybody in our society equally. And we don't ensure that we get these wonderful, miraculous cures and treatments to everyone who needs them. Um, I'm heartened to see that Senator Torres is going to be leading the excess access and affordability uh, effort at CIRM. I think we really need to make this our number one priority. So I apologize for the lecture. I'm tremendously honored uh, by the board and I'm very heartened by some of the direction that the board is and the agency has taken. Uh, but for myself, it's I have no sense of laurels to rest on. I really, um, like I said, feel a deep sense of failure. So thank you. All right, well, thank you, Jeff. And I just, uh, those are very important words of admonition. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, as, as always, look to try uh, as best we can to uh, advance all of that cause, uh, which is so important. And if we don't succeed in getting to the underserved and to the issues of affordability and accessibility, et cetera, uh, it, it will, uh, will not be a good result, but we will be unrelenting in our efforts. Uh, and uh, thank you for that. And thank you as well for, uh, uh, as Oz said, uh, an incredible amount of work that you did uh, in so many different capacities over the first 16 years of CIRM, uh, which among other things uh, involved uh, uh, an, an amazing uh, granularity in your attention to the grants as they were reviewed in the grants working group. Uh, and it, uh, it, as, you, as you all noticed, there was no reference to Jeff being a PhD in his resolution, but if you uh, were to have heard him in the grants working group and the level of detail and understanding that he showed uh, from the scientific perspective on, uh, on the many, many grants that he was part of reviewing, uh, it was most impressive and indicative of the effort that he gave uh, across the board to the agency. So Jeff, just thank you uh, very much for everything you did on behalf of the state of California and for patients everywhere. Uh, JT, this is Oz. Can I just say one more thing? And I'm sorry, I, uh, uh, I, I just have to say, Jeff, if what you did is failure, we should all aspire to fail in the same way. You have achieved so much in advancing the causes that uh, that you have driven. So you know, I just had to say that. Uh, thank you. And to Jeff and to Francisco, uh, not yet to Oz. Uh, Oz, you're, we we still have you for a while. Uh, just for everybody's benefit, uh, the as being founding board members of CIRM, uh, 
everybody needs to understand that it was the uh, the wild, wild west when things got going. There was no template for CIRM. There was, uh, and, and by the way, still nothing comparable anywhere in the world, though others have aspired to that. Uh, but the, the effort that needed to be undertaken to take uh, the vision uh, that, that Bob Klein had uh, in creating CIRM and making it into a, ooh, nice Oz, I like that hat, uh, making it into a functioning world-class grant-making operation uh, was a tremendous undertaking. Uh, and, and all of that pioneering work uh, that Francisco and Jeff and Oz uh, did uh, has set the table for the well-oiled machine that is CIRM these days that, uh, uh, as before, continues to be the envy of, uh, of uh, the world, really, and our ability to drive and accelerate uh, change in medicine and bring treatments and cures to patients. And so I, for all of the, the newer members, of which everybody is a newer member than the the three of them. Uh, I just uh, wanted to thank you so much for your foundational work, which was so critical and key to the success of the operation uh, and for, uh, for everything uh, that uh, you've done in the interim, which uh, cannot be overstated in its importance. Uh, and Oz will, will deal with you in more detail down the road a bit. So, uh, but just wanted to say that. So special, special thanks to all of you. Okay, we have uh, JT. JT. Yeah. Anne Marie has her hand raised. Anne Marie. Yeah. Just JT, I wanted to add everyone's um, uh, to everyone's kudos to all of those who are going to leave or have left uh, the board, our colleagues, but special one to to you, uh, Jeff. Um, yeah. I remember when I started, you were one of those who helped me a lot find my way around, but we had in common the fight against HIV. You at your core, and that has been your life, myself very much involved pretty much from the get-go in HIV vaccine development and immunotherapy. So we shared that, and I've always admired um, your, your dedication and how effective you are in many ways. So kudos and thank you. Okay. Thank you, Emory. Okay, uh, our final resolution of the day uh, is for Diane Winnaker, who is not able to join us today, but I will, as before, read her resolution. JT? Yes. Oh, Sorry, hello, Isabel. Uh, Johnny come lately, but I just wanted to say one last thing before Jeff leaves the Please. The Thank you. Uh, Jeff, first of all, uh, it is my belief that there is the only failure is in not trying. So thank you for all of the work you have put in because it has made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Uh, thank you also for when I first put one of my first motions uh, on the table that you were there to support me. That made a great deal of difference to me as we tried to move the whole issue of DEI, inclusion, clinical trials, and this particularly for the COVID awards, uh, really helped me and I appreciate that. I think many advocates and many advocates of color come to boards are unsure about, about how to use their voice and who will champion the, what they are concerned about. And I wanna thank you for being there for me and helping me express what I wanted to say in order to get that passed. So thank you and I will always remember you very fondly. Thank you, Isabel. Okay. The resolution for Diane Winnaker. Whereas Diane Winnaker received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, whereas Dr. Winnaker, I'm sorry, Ms. Winnaker received her Master of Arts from San Francisco State University, whereas Ms. Winnaker in an, is an invaluable advocate in the field of ALS research, whereas the passing away of her sons, Douglas and Hugh from ALS inspired Ms. Winnaker's tenacious and tireless advocacy Whereas Ms. Winnaker's tragic direct experience with ALS catalyzed her commitment to provide a deeper understanding within the scientific community of the disease. Whereas Ms. Winnaker has advocated for ALS research at the local, state, and federal levels. Whereas Ms. Winnaker has been an active leader nationally and internationally in science and technology. 
Whereas Ms. Winokur has a keen grasp of public-private partnerships that drive innovation and discovery. Whereas Ms. Winokur is a tireless fundraiser for ALS research. Whereas Ms. Winokur participated in the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, a viral fundraising challenge designed to raise funds and awareness of ALS. Whereas Ms. Winokur and her family helped found the ALS Treatment and Research Center at the University of California, San Francisco, a certified center of excellence of the ALS Association. Whereas Ms. Winokur and her family established the Winokur Family Research Initiative designed to fund early stage research through a collaboration between the ALS Association and the Robert Packard Center for ALS Research at Johns Hopkins University. Whereas Ms. Winokur has been an active board member of several nationally renowned organizations. Whereas Ms. Winokur served on the ALS Association's National Board of Trustees for five years. Whereas Ms. Winokur also served on the Golden West chapter of the ALS Association. Whereas Ms. Winokur served as a board member of the Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute in La Jolla, California. Whereas Ms. Winokur currently serves as a board member of the Packard Center for ALS Research at Johns Hopkins University. Whereas Ms. Winokur was a pivotal advocate for the passage of Prop 71 in 2004, the ballot measure that created CIRM, and Prop 14 in 2020, the ballot measure that extended CIRM's funding. Whereas Ms. Winokur was appointed by the Lieutenant Governor Gavin, then Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, to the ICOC as the board's patient advocate member for ALS and multiple sclerosis. Whereas Ms. Winokur, through her service on the ICOC, has been a patient advocate for all Californians, whereas CIRM funded two clinical trials that offer hope to those touched by ALS. Whereas Ms. Winokur, through her experience, commitment, knowledge, and leadership, contributed greatly to the momentum of discovery in the future of therapies, which will be the ultimate outcome of the dedicated work of the researchers, researchers receiving CIRM funding be it resolved that the governing board of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, on behalf of the people of the state of California, wishes to express its deepest gratitude to Ms. Diane Winokur for her service on CIRM's governing board and for her dedication to the advancement of stem cell research and to the mission of CIRM to accelerate stem cell treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. Diane Winokur. Okay, we need a resolution, uh, I'm sorry, a motion to approve all five resolutions by the board. Do I hear such a motion? So moved, this is Oz. Moved by Oz, is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, I think, who is the second there? Isabel. Isabel, just beat out Al. Okay, we'll go with Isabel. All right, thank you. Uh, Maria, will you please call the roll? Dan Bernal, George Blumenthal. Yes. Linda yeah. Boxer. Yes. Allison Brashear. Yes. Leander, thank you. Leander Clark Harvey. Yes. Deborah Deese. Yes. Anne Marie Dulage. Yes. Isabel Duron. Yes. Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. Elena Flowers. Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. Yes. Steve Jules Gard. Yes. Kim jo Joseph Kim. Yes. Pat Levitt. Yes. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. Shlomo Melmed. Yes. Christine Miaskowski. Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan. Yes. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Al Roulette. Yes. Michael Stamos. Yes. Oz Stewart. Yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Christina Bori. Yes. Carol Watson. Yes. Keith Yamamoto. The motion carries. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we'll now go to the president's report, Dr. Milan.
Thank you, Chairman Thomas, members of the board, members of the public and CIRM colleagues. On behalf of CIRM, I first want to also express our gratitude as a team to our departing board members. We stand on your sh shoulders as we continue CIRM's mission and a warm welcome to our new board members. It's been six months since CIRM was reauthorized under Proposition 14, and I'm pleased to provide an update today of CIRM's progress um, in these past six months. Before I continue, I want to acknowledge this moment and how different things were from, six, from last June when I addressed this board. Last June, we were still um, in an uncertain um, territory. We did not know whether the ballot initiative would even make it onto the ballot. Um, last June, we were in the thick of the COVID pandemic, uncertain about a way out with no available vaccines yet at that time to control its spread. Last June, Juneteenth was not a federal holiday, which it is today just recently passed. Um, and by the way, it's the same day as Sickle Cell Awareness Day. CIRM is proud that under the leadership of Isabel Duron and other board members, Al Roulette and others, that we have already started to incorporate DEI considerations, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and embed it within our CIRM programs. There's much work to be done, but we're so pleased that we've got that started. In addition, CIRM is also proud to be part of the National Cure Sickle Cell Initiative in partnership with the NIH. Where we are today is therefore a happy ending for Prop 71 and a strong beginning for Prop 14. Sham, please, next slide. Is Sham uh, projecting my slide? <laughs> now he is. All right, thanks, Sham. So just by way of background, and especially for the new members uh, of the board and the new team members, CIRM, as you know, was created by patient advocates and California stakeholders initially under Proposition 71, which authorized $3 billion in bond funding. This funded over 1,030 programs and what we call pillars, and you'll hear that terminology, um, which are our core funding programs, which are discovery, translational programs, clinical research, infrastructure and education. And you'll hear more about that as, the, as today's meeting progresses. Um, and we funded under both Prop 71 funds and then transitioning into the new uh, funding mechanism, 70 clinical trials. Most of them are first in human regenerative medicine, cell and gene therapy clinical trials. When CIRM was formed in 2004, I don't, it wasn't even really a field yet, regenerative medicine. And so to look just to even what has happened in Prop 71, we are in amazing position to, to go forward under the $5.5 billion bond initiative just passed in November. Next slide, please, Sean. So as a quick snapshot of where we ended up with the Prop 71 era, you can see the investments um, as summarized here in infrastructure, almost a half a billion dollars, education, 200 million, almost a billion dollars in discovery programs, 360 million in um, translation and 760 million in clinical. In the Prop 14 era, as was mentioned earlier um, by uh, Chairman Thomas, under the direction of some of our departing board members, nothing was in place. And so things were in a build phase. Infrastructure needed to be set up, um, an ability to attract scientists um, through education and, and faculty position um, um, awards. And discovery programs were the predominant types of awards that were given out. As the um, agency matured, as the science matured, we shifted more to the translational and clinical programs. And essentially, because we did not know whether CIRM would be refunded, had to unfortunately shut off funding at the very end of CIRM, predominantly shut off funding, although we were able to, to uh, fund some COVID programs to discovery. And you will see in the upcoming board meetings how we are now in a position where we no longer are trying to figure out, will there be clinical stage programs? Because in the 2004 scenario, it, wasn't, it was unclear as to whether the science would make it to clinics. So now we know they are, so we will have a different philosophy going forward to make sure that we support the entire pipeline, and that's important. 
Um, before I go too deep into that, I wanted to talk about what our strategic accomplishments had been in the last leg of Prop 71, the final five years under the 2016-2020 um, strategic plan. We had bold goals as many of the board members who were uh, um, uh, part of this organization at the time that we set forth with the Prop 71 funds for its final leg. We set forth to bring in 50 new candidates and we brought in 46. We actually had more, but we were limited by Prop 71 funds. So enter Prop 14 just in time. We achieved the goal of advancing our pipeline with a 100% increase in advancing from discovery to translation to clinical um, for our therapeutic, for our programs getting into therapeutic um, uh, development pathways. In terms of shaping the regulatory paradigm, CIRM was supportive of the 21st Century Cures Act and the creation of the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy designation at the FDA. CIRM programs were, were among the first to achieve this, design, this expedited pathway designation, which allows a collaborative effort with the FDA with these new technologies. Today, we have over eight of these RMAT designations, which is significant. We also had a goal to cut development time in half and a surrogate for that is how long it took to get our programs to get from IND enabling stage and to achieve an IND, an investigational, investigational new drug designation, which means that these programs could get into the clinics, into clinical trials. And 73% of our programs that were funded by this board um, had achieved an IND within two years. That's quite remarkable. And we had a very bold goal of adding 50 new clinical trials into part, our portfolio. We exceeded that goal, the 51 new clinical trials, and thereafter several more during this transition time, bringing the total of directly funded CIRM to currently 70 clinical trials. We also had this goal because early on, even when we started the strategic plan in 2004, there was very little industry pull. We knew that as an agency, we could fund the early research, de-risk it, fund the science, but we knew that we would not be able to bring it all the way to commercialization. So it was absolutely critical that the programs were teed up to, it, to attract investment and commercialization partners. So we had a goal of partnering 50% of our late stage programs. And in fact, we exceeded it and 59% of our late stage programs have achieved commercialization partnerships. On top of that, we've seen a market increase in industry pull with investments by way of acquisition licensing and uh, companies going public. It's today about 18 billion or so. Um, you'll get an update from our business development director shortly. But at the time with Prop 71, um, already at that time, we, we clocked in about $12 billion in industry um, support a surrogate measure for um, confidence in these technology platforms. Next slide, please, Sean. So the, here's where we are today. This is our identity. CIRM is a unique funding agency, as JT had mentioned. CIRM is such a unique funding agency that the NHLBI partnered with us on such a bold goal as Cure Sickle Cell because they realized we did have the systems and the philosophy and the expertise in place to partner with. And they actually are using our funding mechanism, our applications, our review um, mechanism in order to inform their co-funding of our programs. And so that Cure Sickle Cell um, MOU, um, Memorandum of Understanding is actually a functional one, is an indication and a validation for our funding um, mechanism. So we're an accelerating patient-centric funder. We are a de-risker. You'll hear from Sean Patel, our director of business development, um, exactly how we de-risk these programs so that when they're initially um, unable to get funding but have strong science, they get the necessary information to determine and attract partners later on. We fund basic translational clinical research, send up critical, set up critical infrastructure and education programs to build the workforce of tomorrow and the experts and leaders of tomorrow. The idea therefore, and I presented to this board um, last year in January and then in June and then later in the year is to build upon this success by making sure 
that we retain the value and the asset of the funding model, but building upon that. And meanwhile, we're in the midst of strategic planning that's arranged into four kind of focus areas um, shown here on the right side of the slide to advance world-class science, build pathways to commercialization, increase patient access to innovative um, treatments, and that's equitable patient access to innovative treatments that are developed by our programs and to maximize our impact through operational excellence. So both the strategic planning and the refinements we're making to our internal operations um, are following these objectives and serving these kind of broad categories. Next slide, please, Sean. So today I would like to give an, a very brief update and you'll get more detail into this in upcoming board meeting of where we are. So January of 2021, we launched Prop 14. We actually never really closed down. We went to, uh, we were slowing down, went into lower gear in terms of our funding programs. And then we started right back up and opened up the so-called pillar programs. Uh, DISC-2, which is candidate discovery programs, TRAN is translational and CLIN clinical, either preclinical getting to IND or clinical trials themselves all the way to phase three. We brought to the board and got approved concept changes, amendments and strategic elements that we, uh, we brought to those pillar programs, those standing pillar programs, including uh, start, the starting point, and it's just a starting point for data sharing. And I'll get into that a little bit more in, on, in um, future board meetings, but many of you who've been involved in the strategic concepts know that the whole, um, that we are um, building into our strategic planning ways that we can build upon the ecosystem and our funding models to create knowledge networks and more efficient sharing of data. And then of course, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, this is a subject, it's actually in real time, it's already in practice. Our board members have been um, shaping along you know, with us and giving us feedback in terms of how these considerations truly are not just a, um, a token um, uh, effort, but a real effort in terms of incorporating it into how we look at the, pro our programs, how we fund our programs, how we evaluate our programs. We've reopened our first set of education programs, uh, so-called Bridges, which is um, an undergraduate and master's degree program that uh, emphasize uh, providing, providing access to underserved communities and uh, minority communities for access into educational um, pathways in the stem cell regenerative medicine space. Uh, the training lab-based fellowships has been approved, it's in process, and the SPARK program, which is a high school internship program. All of these are on ramps at various stages where students and the community um, could have a way to come into this field. And then we also, this board also supported bridging supplements because as we're in the midst of creating a strategic plan, there is some very valuable infrastructure and programs, both in education and in our alpha clinics, clinical network program that would otherwise uh, be at risk. So we have bridging supplements to get us to the, the expansion and the new uh, program announcements that will be rolled out with the strategic plan at the end of the year. We've instituted the first get, we will be instituting the first set of scope, what's called scope and what, what programs are eligible and what should we be funding amendments to the candidate discovery translational and clinical programs. You will hear from Dr. Gil Sombrano, our um, director of review later on today with those, that, um, that uh, proposal to the board for, for action today. And then coming up as uh, JT mentioned, we will be bringing to you even before the passage of, even before the, the, the formal uh, approval of the strategic plan, additional pillar programs, including a basic discovery that's distinguished from the candidate discovery um, program announcements, as well as an additional undergraduate educational programs. More on that um, soon. In terms of internal operations, it has been a whirlwind. This ramp up has been a very, very steep ramp up. I want to give thanks to this leadership team at CERM, which is incredible and unparalleled, honestly. I want to give a special thank you to Maria Bonneville. I have to say, 
that we had our, our director of HR had just retired, had brought us all the way through the transition and retired at the time when we were ramping up. And she was able through her sheer will and influence um, get us support. So we were able to, along with the rest of the leadership team and the rest of the organization, um, recruit top notch candidates. In a very, very rigorous and competitive process, we have 10 key hires, which I, and I will share, share that a little bit more detail on that shortly. We also were able to launch an operational, um, uh, the, the process so we can bring to you today an operational and research budget. I guess um, that will be presented later on for action today um, by Jennifer Lewis, our director of grants management and our acting director of um, finance. But we now have a new director of finance and I'll be um, um, introducing her shortly. And then strategic plan, we are well on our way. Um, we have, we're working on the first draft uh, as a working draft so that we can continue to bring in key input. How are we getting the input? We're getting it from um, multi-stakeholder meetings, including the strategic scientific advisory panel or scientific strategy advisory panel that Je uh, um, Chairman Thomas and I had convened in, in February um, and had brought to this board the summary of, and we've also um, already started to implement changes based on the advice of the SSAP. Um, and also a, a, major, a, a variety of different workshops where various board members had participated, including Keith Yadamamoto regarding data um, science, Isabel Duran regarding patient outreach navigation and um, equity in, in clinical research. Um, and a variety of other workshops. We are going to get um, have the town hall meeting where we'll have the research stakeholders of California, the, the institute leaders, as well as trainees and the scientific community at that town hall so that we could have a bi-directional discussion of what CERM programs look like and, and, and also seek some input from them um, uh, regarding some of the strategic concepts we're developing. Um, you will hear later on today a, an update on the industry academia type partnerships, uh, the Biocom partnering event, um, manufacturing workshop from Sean Patel. Um, and we have additional workshops in development. We brought on a, a, um, a, a science officer, not, not sorry, a strategic and uh, strategic initiatives and special projects. This is such a complicated name, but it's a special projects officer, Mitra Hushman, who's been instrumental in helping me and the leadership team um, get these workshops, the town hall. Um, she's kind of the lead uh, in helping us get on paper and structure along with our, uh, Sean Patel from Business Development, uh, the strategic plan. I wanna uh, give a special shout out to them because they have made it possible to do all this. And so with that, we do plan to have a draft strategic plan brought to you for input and discussion in October at the board meeting so that we can um, bring a, a concept, um, a strategic plan for approval um, in December of this year. Next slide, please, Sean. Okay. So I wanted to show, share the screenshot. This was the wind down team. This is us last year during those times of uncertainty and still working. I, we were, even before we knew we were gonna be refunded, we were already working on the strategic plan. Um, during the COVID crisis, we had an emergency uh, COVID round that started with a call between me and JT on a weekend. And within a week, this team, this leadership team, the, the CIRM team was able to, to get a concept plan and launch our COVID funding rounds, which is remarkable. Um, so this is the CIRM wind down team. And it really, it was a wind down team, but we never slowed down. And it's also the, the Prop 14 launch team. In the middle there is Denise, who was our director of HR, who, who served us very well all through the through the wind down. She finally had to retire. She just gave her all. I have to thank all of our retirees and our retired annuitants, Chila Silva Martin and um, Pat Olson, who all through this time as retire retired annuitants continued to serve us. So I, I, I really wanna um, share the depth of gratitude to all of our team members who brought us all the way through these times of uncertainty and really never gave up. So thank you. And now next slide, please. It's my great pleasure 
to introduce the new team members. We mentioned that there are 10 new team members and here's proof. These are their pictures. <laughs> and I'm gonna just really if, um, kind of go through all of them. And because I don't wanna miss um, kind of their descriptions, um, we're gonna go by chronological order. Claudette Mondock joined us on April 1st as project manager of review. As you saw, we, re we restarted the pillar programs right away. She just kind of hit the ground running along with this, um, the rest of this highly functioning, highly productive review team under Gil Sombrano. Uh, Claudette comes to us from UCSF where she managed um, uh, human uh, subjects and all the associated processes to that. Um, I mentioned Mitra Hushmand, who is our Senior Science Officer for Special Projects and Strategic Initiatives. Um, uh, Mitra was a scientific director at, um, for the Prop 14, um, Americans for Cures, uh, which was involved in Prop 14. Mitra has dedicated her career to stem cells. She, this is where she had done her PhD and her research was in um, neuroscience and spinal cord injury. And um, when she applied for the job, she said, this is where I wanted to be. And we're just so pleased that Mitra's here. She brings incredible wealth of knowledge and skill to this position. On April 19th, Vanessa Singh, uh, with, who has extensive state service, had joined us as, as our HR manager. Um, and she's been just um, a, a really wonderful member of the team. Feels like she's already been here for a while, as you can see. She probably, by looking at the number of recruits we have, she has been very busy along with the rest of the team. I'm, pl I'm pleased to announce Pune Simpson, our Director of Finance, who also has extensive uh, state experience, uh, joined us in May. Um, and Pune is a member of the leadership team. We're so proud and so happy that she decided to, to join us. And she is uh, mission-driven and so excited for this, for this phase. I'm gonna look at, um, because there's so many members, I need to make sure that that I um, talk to you about. Okay, so she, so Pune comes to us from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, where she'd served as a Recovery Financial Administration Chief. And she was previously the Chief Financial Officer for the Veterans Home. So she has uh, extensive experience with state, state agencies um, and control agencies. So welcome to Pune. Um, and then the next two are joining our grants management group under Jennifer Lewis, Alexandra Caraballo, and Nelly Almazan. Both also bring really unique experiences. Alexandra has over 10 years uh, experience at the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan as a national philanthropy manager. She's an MBA candidate at the University of Denver. Um, she should be getting that shortly. Nelly Almazan uh, started just in the beginning of June. She has 10 years of experience with the Depart of Department of Transportation Low Carbon Trans Transit Operations Program. And what's really amazing about that is Nelly has been involved in how they're in, in that, in her previous role, um, it was very much a priority for them to, to determine the diversity, equity, and inclusion components when they re resource different areas. So she brings a lot of kind of background and information and, and knowledge to us in that regard. So, um, and then I'm going to introduce Kevin Marks. Hopefully he's here. I'd love for him to just kind of say hello to everybody and say a few words. Kevin Marks is our new general counsel. We are so fortunate. Kevin brings uh, industry broad legal and importantly, business legal leadership experience from his over 20 years at Roche, where he served as general counsel in a variety of capacities. Um, we're so fortunate to have in, in Kevin all wrapped up this legal knowledge, business knowledge in a person who's so mission driven, excited by the medical innovation and the, the content itself. And he is known to promote DEI in the workplace. In fact, um, Kevin was honored with a Bay Area Corporate Council Award by the Silicon Valley Business Journal in 2019 for his leadership, and he was noted to have a socially progressive approach. So in addition to overseeing the legal department, Kevin will also see human resources, grants management, and operations. Um, Kevin, if you wouldn't mind, please just say, saying hello to everybody and sharing a few words. Sure. Thanks, Maria. Uh, and and uh, welcome. Uh, me, uh, 
you know, it's it's nice to meet you uh, virtually and hopefully you know, over the next few months as we start to reintroduce uh, in-person meetings, I'll get an opportunity to meet a lot of the board members. Um, incredibly excited uh, as my first week of, of starting here, you know, drinking from the fire hose, so to speak, but honestly can't think of a better position to launch a new chapter in my career that really matches the passions in my life, which is ensuring I stayed in life sciences and exploring solutions for patients increasing my role in public service, which has been an increased passion of mine over the last few years. And finally, as Maria mentioned, a commitment to, to DEI, not only in the workplace, but also from a societal perspective. So as you can tell, I don't know if you can see me on video, I've got my sleeves already rolled up. I'm ready to go uh, and very excited. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin. And so I will also want, in a, in a few moments, it's not going to be a new team member, but I, I would like one of our, uh, one of our legacy team members to give a couple of comments. So Maria Bonneville, um, I wanted her to say a few words. We're migrating human resources and IT into Kevin's group. And, and the reason we're doing that is to get the operational um, kind of components streamlined in the agency. But most importantly is so that we can strategically um, elevate and grow Maria Bonneville's role. All of you know her, she's uh, just a, 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 an instrumental, and invaluable member of our team who serves as our board uh, executive director. Maria Bonneville will now concentrate on the board and board governance and subcommittees and everything else we need with this growing board and the amazing um, uh, and ambitious um, initiatives, including that led by uh, Senator Torres and, and the Accessible and Affordability Work Group, as well as growing a lot with the leadership of um, our board member, Isabel Duran, our public outreach and community outreach that integrates and aligns with our scientific programs and, and the entire mission. So Maria Bonneville, known to everybody, if you wouldn't mind please saying just a few words. Um, it's just been so wonderful to um, work with the board all these years. That's how I started at CIRM, um, was working um, exclusively with the board. And it was, um, it's always just been the highlight of my job. So I'm glad um, that it gets to grow and continue. And I'm really excited about focusing my attention also on public outreach, communications, and really working with our advocacy teams um, internally and externally and, um, and working with everyone. So thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, okay, after that brief break, I'm gonna go on. <laughs> as you can see, this is a good problem to have when the introductions are almost as long as JT's whereas is from the beginning of the meeting. Yeah, really, so Maria. Then, <laughs> so, <laughs> Maria. Yes. Yes, I just wanted to add, this is Art. I just wanted to add my uh, congratulations to you and to the leadership team and, and of course to Maria Bonneville whose uh, family I've known for, God, over 30 years. Her mother and I worked together in politics years ago. And to see her absolutely blossom in this new role, I think is terrific. I also th I wanna send kudos for, for hiring Mitra Hushman, because Mitra really has extensive relationship with patient advocates statewide, which I know of personally, because I worked with her on my own time and vacation time on Prop 14. And I, I think that she's gonna add tremendously to our effort. And to bring back the old veteranas. Oh, Rosa, you're stealing my thunder, Senator. Oh, I'm sorry. Rosa, <laughs> I'm gonna to let you talk there. <laughs> I, when I first came in 2009, they were my buddies. They were my support group. And I missed them when they left. And I just can't believe they're coming back. That's the first time I heard they're coming back. So great kudos to you, Maria. Good hires. These women are leaders. And they're committed. And uh, they're, they're passionate. And they're loyal to the mission. So congratulations. Thank you so much, Senator Torres. Always wonderful to have your support. And, and um, now, Michael Bunch joined us just this past Tuesday, a day after Kevin Marks joined us. He is our, into our finance group hired by Pune Simpson, already at work. He comes to us from the California Department of Veterans Affairs, where he was a chief business officer of the Yonville Veterans Home. Um, Michael will be our business services officer. We're so pleased to have him. He is a decorated uh, US Army veteran who served for over, distinguished service for 25 years. Welcome, Michael. Now to um, uh, return 
um, team members that who Art uh, alluded to are Rosa Canet Aviles, who will be joining us next week. Rosa will be our new Vice President of Scientific Programs. We are so thrilled that she's joining us and it's a timely return to CIRM as we build our new strategic plan under Prop 14. Rosa and I have kept in touch through the years and time and time again, she's demonstrated a unique ability to bring together often seemingly disparate stakeholders, sometimes with actually competing interests, but successfully driving toward a common goal of advancing the science on behalf of patients with neurodegenerative diseases and neuropsychiatric diseases. Before she left CIRM the first time, she actually assembled a key group of international leaders that led to what's called G-Force, an international Parkinson's disease consortium. And some of those programs have already um, started to get into the clinical trial. At the foundation for the NIH, where she, le- where she went to after CIRM, she directed the development of five prominent public-private partnerships called AMPs, Advancing Med- Medicine Partnerships in Alzheimer's, Uh, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, as well as other biomarker consortia. She is a neuroscientist by training and held in high regard. I did her, uh, I've spoke to at least three or four colleagues in top top positions at the uh, NIH, and all of them had the most um, um, amazing things to say about Rosa, but specifically that she's a quick study. Not only was she um, able to bring people together and deploy her expertise in neuroscience, She led in even new areas such as genomics and data sciences and was able to operationally make sure that that was something that could go forward for those initiatives. And then finally, Uta Grishimer, who uh, was recruited into Rosa's group, will be joining us shortly after Rosa. Um, Uta is also a highly respected and beloved um, uh, former team CIRM member, um, CIRM team member, and now she's coming back to join Team CIRM. She is um, a development biologist with extensive expertise in stem cell biology and molecular and cellular mechanisms of embryonic development and cancer. She also has additional expertise in genetics, genomics, precision medicine. In fact, she joined um, Atul Boot and his precision medicine initiative at UCSF. That's where she had gone um, in 2015. And then since then, she's been at the UC uh, Office of the President as a program officer for tobacco-related disease research. Uta is the reason that we had our genomics um, uh, centers of excellence, stem cell centers of excellence, and our IPSC bank. She, she took that from concept to management. So we're really pleased that she will be back with us. Um, and uh, we actually have additional um, positions posted, so you'll be hearing about more team members. They, Every single one of these new team members has onboarded and has, has hit the ground running, and we're just so fortunate um, to have them. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, that's it. So this is my time to introduce Sean Patel, our Director of Business Development, who will be giving an update on our um, industry partnerships, as well as the workshops that have taken place just re- in, this, in these past six months to inform our strategic planning process. Sham, he's also my uh, slide advancer. Thank you, Sham. Thank you, Dr. Milan, and thank you to Chairman Thomas and the ICOC for giving this opportunity to speak to you today. So before I begin, whereas I cannot reliably pronounce the word strategic, I'll be using the word strat, and I hope that you'll pardon this uh, shorthand throughout my presentation. So as Maria mentioned, I'll be talking to you about the business development update, as well as two workshops that are informing our strat planning process. So as both Chairman Thomas and um, Maria Milan have have, uh, mentioned, um, CERM's funding model is designed to accelerate and de-risk the development of novel therapies until they can attract industry support, which could be in the form of technology licensing, investments, strategic partnerships, or mergers and acquisitions. It's also critical that this industry support is sustained and escalated as the projects advance in their development. We track several different measures of industry support in CERM funded programs. I'd like to highlight some of them for you here. So first of all, over 50% of CERM clinical programs are partnered with industry as Maria Milan mentioned, and at a minimum they've secured venture backing. To date, six CERM funded companies have gone public either via IPOs or special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs. 
and four CERM funded companies were acquired by biopharma partners. And this has all happened while they had CERM awards or after their CERM awards. CERM funding of early innovative research at academic institutions has also contributed to the launch of over 46 companies, some of which have gone on to receive their own CERM grants. And to date, CERM funded projects have attracted at least $18.2 billion in industry support. And this will continue to grow as the projects mature and we add to the pipeline. And while industry partnering of CERM funded projects has the potential to generate returns for the state, it's important to note that both the timing and amount are dependent on the CERM regulations governing those awards, the stage of the project, and finally, the amount of licensing or sales revenue that is generated. Now I gave you a whole bunch of numbers and I wanna give you some context behind those. So to show the range of industry partnerships and sustained industry investment in CERM funded projects, I'm gonna highlight some of the events of the first half of 2021. Two CERM funded companies, Solarity and Jasper are both going public via SPAC mergers. Those are in the process right now and that's gonna result in them having significant proceeds to continue development of their cell therapies and, and uh, conditioning therapies. CERM and NHLBI funded Dr. Porteous's IND enabling studies of a CRISPR gene correction therapy for sickle cell disease at Stanford. Graphite Bio officially launched last year to continue to clinical development of this therapy, as well as another CERM funded therapy. And that sickle cell disease gene correction therapy is in the clinic now. In about a 14 month span, the company has raised two large venture financing rounds, including $150 million Series B. And it recently filed an S1 with the SEC to go public. So this company is on a fast track and that was partly enabled by CERM having funded the ability to get to the clinic with this CRISPR gene therapy. Already public companies like Lineage Cell Therapeutics continue to raise additional funding in the public markets to support clinical development of the cell therapy pipelines, including the uh, spinal cord injury cell therapy candidate that CERM has funded in the past. And finally, um, as many of you seen in the news repeatedly, startups continue to raise significant Series A financing as illustrated by Apia Bio. CERM funding helped Dr. Lily Young at UCLA develop stem cell engineering technology that generates INK T cells for cancer therapies. And this has contributed to the launch of the female founded, female led company, Apia Bio. The company raised $52 million in Series A financing led by CERM's industry alliance partner, 8VC which also led its seed funding. Which brings me to the Industry Alliance program. So this was launched a couple of years ago to build a collaborative network of industry partners that facilitates partnering opportunities for CERM grantees. Uh, so essentially what this means is that the CERM BD team assists both the CERM grantees and the industry partners throughout the entire process as needed, ranging from making introductions on partnering opportunities and assisting them along the way until partner negotiations. We currently have nine active partners ranging from big pharma to biotechs and venture capital firms. Three partners joined this year as part of our expansion plan for the IAP. These include 8VC, Eclipse Ventures, and Synthigo. <clears throat> 8VC is a venture capital firm with a track record of investing in innovative cell and gene therapy companies such as Lyell, Cinema Therapeutics, and Mammoth Bio. Eclipse Ventures invest in companies that are digitizing industries such as drug manufacturing, devices, diagnostics, and the healthcare and delivery. Finally, Synthigo is a leader in gene editing technology, IPSC models, and manufacturing automation. Going forward, we will continue to carefully expand the IAP to meet the needs of CIRM's growing portfolio. You may also notice a trend that the three latest IAP partners all have black and white logos. Uh, and I tried to do that for the CIRM logo and it just didn't look as cool as the, the blue and the orange. So um, the BD team has hosted three recent events that have broadly informed our, our strat planning process. I described the meeting of our IAP partners at the January ICOC meeting. Here I'll describe two more recent events. In March, CERM and Biocom hosted a unique three-part partnering event. And it was the first time that either CERM or Biocom had done something like this. CERM and Biocom first hosted a public plenary session to inform a broad audience of CERM's funding model. To best illustrate the impact of CERM funding after I had spent about 20, 30 minutes speaking myself, we hosted two panel sessions of CERM grantees. The first session consisted of company leaders discussing how CERM funding supported their company's growth and industry partnering. Companies such as Jasper, Viasite, and Poseida have experienced substantial growth while leveraging CERM funding to advance their clinical development of their pipelines. 
<clears throat> Poseidon of Therapeutics has gone public while it was um, CERN funded, Jasper is on its way, and Viaside has continued to raise additional venture capital. Rocket Pharma, which is already a public company when it applied to CERM, has benefited from CERM funding support on three of its five clinical candidates. The second session consisted of academic innovators developing novel therapies such as in utero stem cell therapy for spina bifida, iPSC derived cell sheets for a rare skin disorder, and a stem cell therapy for Huntington's disease. In addition to the funding, the panelists highlighted CERM support throughout their awards, starting with the science officers who championed their projects and continually advised them on project objectives and milestones. In fact, the moderators of the session were Dr. Lisa Kadak and Dr. Kelly Shepard, both of whom were SOs on these projects. And then the expert timely guidance from CERM advisory panels was also noted as being a huge value add. And finally, the BD team support in navigating partnering decisions. The video from this plenary session is hosted on CERM's YouTube channel for anybody to watch. The other two parts of this event consisted of matched one-on-one -on -one meeting opportunities between 30 CERM grantees and 20 biocom industry partners. While not all of the grantees were selected for one-on-one -on -one meetings, some of those who did went on to have productive follow-on meetings. Similarly, while not all industry partners chose to meet with CERM grantees, they learned about CERM's funding model and the breadth of our project portfolio, and most of them are requested to stay engaged going forward, which is great news for us. Finally, the event enabled participants interested in CERM funding to request meetings with CERM team members. The CERM team has interacted with almost all of these requesters. Thank you to the SOs for doing that. Overall, this partnering event has further informed how we can best support our grantees, and the learnings are being incorporated into our strat planning process, as well as the BD team's long-term goals. More recently, in April, we hosted a focused workshop on the critical topic of cell and gene therapy manufacturing, which continues to pose significant project risks across the entire field. Both Chairman Thomas and Dr. Milan mentioned this uh, workshop. So in recent years, as many of you know, marketing approvals of several late stage cell and gene therapies have stalled due to manufacturing deficiencies. This focus workshop was intended to inform how CIRM can lead the development of collaborative solutions for cell and gene therapy manufacturing in California to help de-risk that process and help ensure that our projects continue to move forward smoothly. It was centered around a vision of a CIRM supported manufacturing network of academic and industry stakeholders. The workshop was attended by over 50 leaders in cell and gene therapy manufacturing, representing GMP manufacturing facilities, supply chain partners, technology platforms, CERM grantees, community colleges and universities, and expert consulting groups. And we tried to get every, all 50 of those participants to speak, and we called on many of them to make sure that we got their responses. The workshop was composed of three sessions. The first session honed in at the project level and discussed best manufacturing practices at all stages of cell and gene therapy development. The second session focused on encouraging deep collaboration between all participants in a California public-private manufacturing network. And the final session explored how to effectively support the development of a diverse manufacturing workforce in California. That had by far the most robust discussion of all the sessions to date. We have prepared a brief summary of the workshop that is publicly posted to this meeting's agenda and will also be available on CERM's website. I'll briefly discuss the key takeaways here. So academic researchers play a critical role in cell and gene therapy discovery and development. They are the early innovators of technology platforms, but they also shepherd the translational development of therapeutic candidates, often into late clinical development, as many of you have seen from the awards that we fund at CERM. Participants noted that CERM has consistently provided training and resources to help its investigators build expertise and experience in translational development. CERM can build on this and lead the way in manufacturing by providing education, training, and resources to these early investigators that best enables them to adopt best practices at the very early stages of cell and gene therapy development. For example, by encouraging long-term project planning and incorporating elements of quality by design, a term you're gonna hear more and more from us going forward, CERM can help manufacturing development keep pace with clinical development to help de-risk these projects in general and to improve the overall quality of the drug product. The participants were broadly supportive of the idea of a collaborative manufacturing network in California. They discussed how it would support all stages of cell and gene therapy manufacturing, promote competencies and standardization, and support workforce development. 
A large proportion of CERN funded projects, as you know, are supported by academic GMP manufacturing facilities throughout the state. CERM could help create academic GMP manufacturing centers of excellence that share, develop, and standardize manufacturing and analytical methods. These academic centers could form the network core, which would then work hand in hand with industry stakeholders to achieve the goals of the network and rapidly advance cell and gene therapies to patients. CERM could also help establish competency hubs for technology platforms. The competency hubs could be particularly impactful for rare disease therapies based on a common technology platform, such as CRISPR, for example. The hubs would act as knowledge networks that aggregate data and know-how gained from translational research, manufacturing, and clinical development of individual cell and gene therapy candidates to advance the entire technology platform. The lesson learned from individual therapies and small clinical trials would all be compounded to advance the entire platform and any subsequent therapies that may come after that. Finally, the workforce development session encouraged a robust discussion on all ways that CERM can encourage collaborations between community colleges, universities, manufacturing facilities, and industry stakeholders. In particular, CERM can use its education and infrastructure pillars to help these stakeholders leverage each other's strengths and develop innovative hands-on training programs for cell and gene therapy manufacturing. These programs will be specifically designed to rapidly and equitably prepare diverse student cohorts to enter or advance in a wide range of career pathways. This could range from technician level to process development and quality assurance. On the whole, the feedback from this workshop is informing CERM how to prioritize manufacturing development in its pipeline funding programs, how to support public-private manufacturing network in California, and how to leverage education and infrastructure pillars to fund innovative workforce development programs. I don't have an ending slide, but uh, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sean. That was uh, a very comprehensive report uh, and I hope everybody can appreciate the uh, not only the extreme amount of work being put in by Sharm and the business development team, but the great progress that we've made in achieving our goals of advancing our projects to industry collaboration. It's uh, a, a work in progress that has seen great success and undoubtedly will only increase as we continue to march along here under Prop 14 going forward. Thank you also, Dr. Milan, for that uh, excellent president's report and for the all the work that you and the team are spearheading this year, which is uh, an, an extreme amount of work <clears throat> and <clears throat> greatly appreciated. And a, a special note uh, of welcome uh, to all of our new or returning uh, members of the CERN team uh, that uh, all world-class hires and appointments and we look forward to working with you going forward so thanks to both of you okay let us now go to our action items we're going to take one out of order uh we're going to start with number 12 which is consideration of applications submitted in response to clinical trial stage projects program announcements clins one two and three uh, this will be presented by dr sombrano Gil. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting and sharing my screen. So give me one moment. All right. So these are the grants working group recommendations for the latest uh, cycle of the clinical program. And just for reference, our, our clinical stage programs uh, offer opportunities for late stage preclinical projects, which we call CLIN1, for clinical trial stage projects, which we call CLIN2, and then for um, accelerating activities that would lead to uh, registration of a, a, a product or of the trial, and we call that a CLIN3. So this is for a, a, a CLIN2 application that was received for this particular cycle. And this slide is just showing you 
uh, the reference to the overall annual allocation that we made for the period of January through June of 2021. There were $100 million uh, that were allocated for the clinical program. The amount that's requested today under this particular uh, application is uh, just under $12 million. And we have uh, had the board approve two uh, previous uh, uh, grants for a total of 14.4. So we're still well within uh, <clears throat> the allocation that was approved. Um, just a brief um, overview of the review criteria that the grants working group utilizes to assess the scientific merit of these applications. Um, they consider these uh, five questions in their evaluation. First, does the project hold the necessary significance and potential for impact, meaning is this something that is of value and is it worth doing? Uh, is the rationale sound? Uh, is the project well planned and designed? And is it feasible? That is, can they do it? Do they have the appropriate resources in place? Do they have the uh, uh, right team members and quality team members to do it? And then finally, does the project address the needs of underserved communities? And in particular for uh, clinical trial projects, can they put together a good outreach uh, and recruitment plan to include a diverse cohort of patients? Um, the scoring system that is used for that scientific score is uh, uh, one of uh, one, two, or three. And so those applications that score a one means that they have exceptional merit and warrant funding. There may be some minor recommendations or adjustments that don't require further review by the grants working group, uh, but otherwise generally uh, it is uh, ready to go. Those that receive a score of two means they uh, need improvement and wouldn't warrant funding. These applications get the opportunity to revise their applications and come back um, for another uh, go at the grants working group uh, review. And then those that receive a score of three are those that are sufficiently flawed that they would not warrant uh, consideration for at least six months, meaning usually that they have a lot more work to do before they come back. And so that's the system of scoring. And so as mentioned earlier, we have also been working on implementing uh, and including DEI within our application process, our review process, and we've been, um, uh, doing this in a variety of ways. So uh, last year when we started the COVID uh, program, the COVID-19 opportunity, we inserted into all the applications the uh, that fifth review criterion about addressing the needs of underserved community. And so as mentioned, this describes the applicant's plan for outreach and engagement of a diverse patient cohort uh, that accounts for racial, ethnic, and gender diversity as part of that trial. And so this is uh, core to the uh, overall um, clinical trial and scientific program. And so the scientific members of the panel uh, include that within their merit score of one, two, or three when they evaluate these applications. But in addition, we've also introduced a uh, more holistic section on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which speaks to the team itself, the composition, the track record of the team, and their overall commitment um, uh, uh, to DEI. And so this section is evaluated and scored by um, the patient advocate or nurse members of the board. And we've developed a, a scoring system of zero to 10, with 10 being the best. And so we are still uh, piloting this in the CLIN program, uh, trying to uh, clarify what the uh, specific review criteria should be uh, how to make sure that instructions are clear both to the applicant and to reviewers about how to score that. Um, so we are um, still going through that, but you will see a score that's related to DEI for um, each of the applications or the one application in this case that I am presenting. So uh, getting down to this specific application that is being uh, Considered. This is uh, CLIN 212319. Yeah. Uh, if I could yes. just interrupt for a second. Now, now that we're, we're heading into actual consideration of uh, this award, we're sort of officially into the application review subcommittee. So I'm going to turn okay, the sure. of this over to Oz as you start this presentation. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you, JT. And thanks, Gil, for uh, leading us into this. Um, so um, maybe I'll just uh, say a word uh, to the new members. Uh, we have quite a few new members who are, in fact, part of the application review subcommittee. Um, you'll be the ones who are voting on it. The institutional members, as everyone knows, reminding everyone, uh, actually don't uh, don't vote on the application. Uh, they're not part of the application review subcommittee. However, uh, you may um, ask uh, questions or make uh, comments about the application, if I'm uh, correct about that, but uh, our general counsel can uh, uh, correct us as we go. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to actually also say, um, I, I do serve on the uh, grants working group and just for those of you who will be voting on this, I, I want to just tell you how incredibly hard working the grants working group is in taking every aspect of uh, a, a review uh, into consideration. All the things that uh, Gil has talked about, about the review criteria and discussed in great detail by the uh, expert review panel with uh, opportunity for active participation by all of the uh, representatives of the of, of the ICOC who actually serve on the grants working group. And I just wanna also take this opportunity to uh, really uh, shout out uh, to Gil uh, and all of the uh, review group of CERM who do such an incredible job about uh, presenting these uh, applications to the grants working group and really uh, doing so in a way that everything is clear and uh, being available to answer questions about both the review process itself and the entire, everything that CERN does. So uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, before we actually get into it. Thank you, Gil, and uh, the rest of the team. Uh, so now back to Gil. Okay, thank you very much, Oz, Pre appreciate it. Um, so for this application, um, this is a cell and gene therapy for ALS. Uh, the therapy itself is an allogeneic neural progenitor cell that's genetically engineered to secrete um, a, uh, the glial-derived neurotrophic factor, um, also known as GDNF. Um, and so obviously the indication is for ALS, and this is for um, ALS that is both sporadic uh, and uh, genetic, and uh, either uh, slow or uh, uh, fast uh, um, advancers of the disease. There, are, um, this is a, uh, for a phase one to a trial and the funds requested is just under 12 million. The applicant uh, is not required to and is not providing co-funding in this particular case. There we go. So a little background uh, on, on the disease indication. So ALS, as uh, I'm sure most know, is an incurable neuromuscular disease uh, that leads to progressive loss of motor neurons in the spinal cord and in the brain, leads to paralysis and death, normally within five years of diagnosis. So this, there's just an absolute huge unmet medical need here. Uh, there are currently no effective treatments uh, and the proposed therapy offers a one-time treatment with the possibility of improved patient outcomes that would include the slowing or halting of disease progression. And um, the reason this is a stem cell project, this um, therapeutic candidate contains neural uh, progenitor cells. So a little bit about uh, our overall clinical portfolio and other um, grants that exist within that portfolio that might be related to this or similar. So the current uh, application is the one shown blue, which uh, is um, the candidate is a GDNS secreting neural progenitor cell um, and it is intended to um, have neuroprotective properties when introduced and or transmitted, it produces astrocytes that uh, release that DGNF and uh, hopefully would restore the microenvironment. Um, and this is gonna be administered in the motor cortex of the brain uh, to have an impact on uh, hand uh, mobility and uh, use. So the, there is a current trial that we have funded by the same team that is due to end in about uh, 
July next month, if uh, all goes well, it may be uh, slightly delayed, but it's essentially the same candidate. And in this trial, uh, they were testing uh, safety and tolerability uh, when administered in the lumbar region. And so they were looking at uh, possible effects to the lower extremities. Uh, we have also uh, supported and funded a, a phase three clinical trial in ALS that is a little bit different. That one utilizes a, a mesenchymal stem cell uh, therapy. That's an autologous uh, approach as opposed to the allogeneic that is proposed above. An autologous bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells that um, also have a protective, oops, I'm sorry took off on me, uh, that have a protective effect uh, by secreting neurotrophic factors in the local area. The um, applicant has had previous CERN funding, uh, and here is um, our, our three uh, projects that uh, have been previously um, uh, uh, been provided in the clinical arena. So the one phase one trial that I just mentioned in ALS, uh, the award for that was about six million, and the goal there was uh, to complete that trial. They were successful in accomplishing the enrollment and dosing uh, of all the patients, and so they basically uh, doing analysis and waiting on the submission of their final clinical study report. Um, we have also uh, funded the IND enabling work for uh, these two clinical trials, so these replete preclinical studies that were part of a, um, a disease team award um, that provided 16 uh, million. So that was the early phases of preclinical safety and toxicity, dose ranging, uh, and so on. There was a phase one trial start that was anticipated but was not uh, achieved. Uh, that one was achieved under the um, CLIN2 award. There's also a phase one clinical trial that was awarded to this applicant uh, for a different indication using largely the same product for retinitis pigmentosa. And so that one is um, uh, currently underway uh, and enrolling patients. And that one is projected to end in 2023. So uh, after review of this uh, current application, the grants working group recommendation is to fund this. Uh, they felt it had exceptional merit and warrants funding with 10 members giving it a score of one. There were three members that gave it a score of two and no one gave it a score of three. The DEI score for this application is an eight. And then just for reference, we were using a rubric that um, basically had four different categories. Things that scored zero to two were not responsive, three to five were partially responsive, six to eight were responsive, and nine to 10 was outstanding. So this one is in the, at the top of a responsive uh, DEI score. And so the CERM recommendation is to fund this uh, in concurrence with the grants working group recommendation for the award amount of uh, 11 million nine hundred and ninety and three hundred and seventy two dollars and uh, I believe that's it for the slides and happy to take any questions on this application thank you Gil um, what I would um, just suggest that we do is uh, have questions uh, and then uh, actually perhaps we could have a motion first but before that uh, just to outline quickly the process so we'll have discussion by the board. After completion of discussion by the board, there will be an opportunity for public comment. And um, if I may, with permission of our board chair, um, I'd actually like to go ahead and um, make the motion to approve this. And I want to do this on behalf of in, and in honor of Diane Winokur, who has just rotated off the board. Uh, um, and who, of course, was our advocate for uh, ALS. If I may, if I may do that, thank Please. you. Second. We have a, a motion and a second. Uh, the application is open for discussion by the board. Then, thank you. Um, Anne Marie has her hand raised. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Gil. Um, I, I see a lot of benefits to this application. Could you please help us understand what is the differentiation 
between this one and other application that you listed and that we have funded previously. I assume it's a clinical program with a different mode of administration. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So the, the previous clinical trial was assessing safety and tolerability in the lumbar region. So they were looking at um, the lower extremities and seeing, you know, leg function. Um, they have moved in this new trial now to the motor cortex to look at hand function and to see what the effect is on there and look for efficacy or potential efficacy there, uh, and as well as obviously safety and tolerability. What is the mode of the route of administration for this trial? So I believe that it's it's direct injection into the motor cortex. Okay. Um, do you know if there were any preliminary preliminary results with this other trial using the same product but administered in a different region? Um, yes. So the, that trial is, I think, near completion, um, and so in terms of of outcomes, some of that was reported in the application. Um, and summarized, um, I think, briefly in some of the comments. So it, in general, it was a positive outcome. There wasn't any, um, uh, the effects were modest, uh, but again, they were looking primarily at safety. Um, so there was hope, and I think the reviewer stressed that, that although there wasn't a dramatic or significant uh, efficacy signal in this first trial, they're hoping that in this trial, they may see that and they offer it as a, a kind of necessary next step to see if um, mm -hmm. this uh, approach is going to work. And my very last question, um, it was not clear whether there is a control group or a control patients among these 16 patients that are going to be included, hopefully. Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know that off the top of my head. Dr. Abla Creasy may actually, I think who's on the line may, may, may know that, or Dr. Milan. I don't know if they could answer that. Uh, I, I think not, and so, but I will check again in a minute. Um, you know, while we're here to trust and support the GWG, um, Am I the only one to have a slight concern about the fact that this is a non-controlled trial? Are there ethical concerns to giving, uh, given the pretty invasive injection in the cortex, to giving control injections to patients? And that may very well be the case. But on the other hand, it will be still somewhat difficult to establish the primary efficacy of the intervention. But. And Marie, the control is they will do one hand versus the other hand is the control. That's Thank the you. way it works. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. Other questions from members of the board? I don't see any hands. Maria, anything? No hands raised. Okay. Um, do we have public comment? Uh, for members of the public, if you could press star nine, if you would like to um, participate. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, excellent. In that case, uh, Maria, could you call the roll? Sure. Dan Bernal, Leandra Clark Harvey, Anne Marie Dulege. Yes. Isabel Dudon, Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. Yes. Elena Flowers, David Higgins. Yes. Steve Julesgard. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Christine Miaskowski. Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan. Yes. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Joe. Thank you. Al Roulette. Yes. <clears throat> Al Stewart. 
Yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Carol Watson. Yes. Thank you. The motion Thank carries. Thank you. And Oz, that. Oz, I have a question for you. Can you um can you tell me who the second was on, on that motion? Uh Art. I believe it was, was Fred Fisher. Oh. oh, okay. Correct. Excellent. Okay, with that, we'll pass it back to JT uh, to continue the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oz. Expertly done, as always. Uh, this is actually a good segue. Uh, Fred, uh, if, if we would love to have you say a few words to the board as you are uh, having your first meeting here, a few words of introduction. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, good uh, morning still, everyone. Uh, I'm Fred Fisher. Uh, I'm currently and have been for the last uh, over 18 years, the president and CEO of the ALS Association Golden West chapter. Uh, I've participated uh, extensively in um, various uh, CIRM efforts, whether it was uh, reporting uh, supporting Prop 71, supporting Prop 14, being a member of uh, uh, at least one, possibly two clinical advisory panels. Um, uh, uh, I was the person responsible for uh, submitting Diane Winokur as the ALS representative uh, 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 for her term on, on the CERM board. And um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, representing the interests of uh, not only ALS patient community, but also the MS uh, patient community. Uh, while my career has not been focused uh, on MS, uh, I, I do have a close uh, family member who has lived with MS for uh, the 35 plus years that, that uh, I've known her as my sister-in-law. Uh, so, um, I come to this opportunity with uh, tremendous enthusiasm for representing the interest of, uh, of patients uh, and family members living with neurodegenerative disease. Honored thank, to be here. Thank you very much, Fred, and welcome aboard. Uh, okay, we are going to now go into a couple of items uh, on the budget. First, on the administrative budget, and second on the scientific research budget, both will be presented by Jennifer Lewis. Jennifer. Thank you, JT. Um, one moment. Let's share my screen. Apologies, one moment. Here we go. Okay. And can you see my slides full screen? Yes. Great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, um, my name again is Jennifer Lewis, and I am the acting um, director um, of the finance team for the wind down and wind up as Marie, Dr. Milan described. Today, I will be presenting the administrative budget proposal for fiscal year 21-22. So here is our agenda for our discussion today. Um, we um, First, I will cover the 2020-21 budget and the financial results of our current budget and the major drivers of those results. Then I will turn to the proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year of 21-22 and the major drivers of that budget. And finally, in, in your materials is a detailed departmental level breakdown of this proposed budget um, that you can access on the CERN website. So first let's dive into the current year 2021 budget. 
Um, before I share the actual results, I wanted to remind everyone of the, um, the context that Dr. Milan described previously of, um, when, of which this budget was created. Um, as, as you know, the a pandemic in 2020 and 2021 has still impacted our, our work and business activities, and that was no different for CIRM. Um, it impacted our reviews and meetings as, as all these were, um, are, are, were done virtually, as well as um, there, were no travel, there was no travel during this period. Um, additionally, from June through 2020 through December 2020, we were operating in a wind down budget as, as described. And um, this, this resulted in reduced staff levels, redistributed workload to current staff that was remaining in the organization. And the major activities were managing the remaining dollars of Prop 71 funding in our COVID-19, our sickle cell, and our pillar programs and discovery, translational, and clinical awards. And then the second half of this budget was created um, as a wind up of AG agency activities from January through June with um, 40 positions, which included nine reestablished positions and an increase in reviews um, in our pillar programs and scientific advisory and strategic planning activities. So now let's um, look at the, um, the financial results from this period um, and, and what contributed to that. Um, as you can see, um, here are the estimated financial results. The first column shows the approved budget of 15.3 million. Um, the agency is currently estimated to finish the year at just over 13.1 million, which is a variance of 2.2 million. As noted previously, um, again, the agency was operating in wind down mode for the first six months of this fiscal year. Thus, the, um, a lot of the savings is due to the team's management of expenditures and really keeping costs low and being mindful of that. And again, as mentioned, additionally, the pandemic provided extra savings in um, host, host, hosting meetings remotely and on Zoom and revert, reviews virtually as well. And um, lastly, there were costs budgeted in our windup over the past six months that just did not materialize at the rate expected, such as hiring. So this slide um, shows just the major categories that, um, that attribute to this 2.2 variance. Um, these are in our employee expenses or personnel, external internal services and in our reviews, meetings, and workshops, which I'll dive into each of these categories in more detail on the next slides. So the first major driver um, in, this budget, in this fiscal year was in um, employee expenses. As you recall, in December, the, this board approved a revised 2021 budget, which included nine reestablished positions for key roles to support the wind up of our um, agency activities and growth of the organization. And as mentioned by Dr. Malan, this was a very ambitious goal. And um, with the efforts of our HR team and really the whole organization, we were able to fill eight of these nine um, key roles to date and had a savings due to start dates that um, um, materialized towards the end of the fiscal year. And one of these positions are still in the later stages of recruiting, but um, which also results in, in some savings um, as it remains unfilled. Also during this fiscal period, there were three vacancies that have occurred during the year. Um, and I can report to date that two of these have, um, have been filled. Um, thus, the, thus, there were some savings um, attributed to these vacancies throughout the fiscal period. Thus, we are estimated to finish the year under budget by 1.1 million while still adding 10 new employees to the team. We also saw savings in the external services budget category, um, which was due to the team really maintaining expenditures under budget um, as we were, we were operating in wind down mode for most of this fiscal year. Um, and additionally, um, many contingency expenditures just did not materialize at the rate we expected, such as um, outside corporate counsel for grant um, related matters. And so um, we are estimated to finish this, um, this year under budget in this area by about half a million or $554,000. And then lastly, the uh, last major driver is um, in reviews, meetings and workshops. And so the last, this, this, this um, last category, the agency was operating in a wind down mode um, in 2021. And um, we, all, we all set to, to keep our expenses low and um, thus things just, just not materialize and there, there are savings in this area. But additionally, as mentioned, all of our meetings and reviews and workshops were um, occurred remotely, um, resulting in additional savings of um, just under $300,000. 
So now I'd like to transition to the 21-22 proposed budget request. Um, this slide shows the proposed 21-22 budget request. The first column displays the, the budget um, of the previous period of 15.3 million, as I just described. Um, and the 21-22 budget is totaling at 21.1 million, which is an increase of about 5.7 million. I did want to note that normally when we present this budget to you, we typically present the um, proposed budget against the estimated financial results of the previous fiscal year. However, given the unique year that I described, um, the decision was made to really that show the, the budget to budget comparison instead as it's a better um, comparator for this, this particular context. And so on the next two slides, I would like to focus in on um, a few areas that are the major drivers of this upcoming year's budget. So the first driver um, of or the overall drivers are, are listed here, sorry, are the 21-2 budget, our personnel, um, reviews, meetings, and workshops, and grant activities, as well as a rent and office expansion. And I'll dive into these a little bit more in the next few slides. So the first key driver of, um, is in employee expenses or personnel. Um, this proposed budget for 21-22 increases personnel by nine positions, which would bring our total HUD count to 49 positions. In addition, this budget also um, assumes a 3% merit, merit salary adjustment for the performance evaluation period that we are finishing at the end of June. And in comparison to the 2021 budget, this, this is an increase of 3.7 million. The second major driver of the 21-22 budget is in our reviews, meetings, and workshops. Um, the CERM team has planned 22 reviews for the 21-22 fiscal year, which is an estimated budget increase of, of about $751,000. And um, last year, due to the pandemic, again, we've conducted all of our, our, our meetings virtually, which has resulted in savings and really successful and productive meetings. Um, and given this, of the 22 reviews we plan for next fiscal year, only two of these will be in person, while the rest of these will be done virtually. And so I will dive a little bit deeper into what's driving this cost on the next slide, but also wanted to mention that also contributing to this um, budget category are an increase in our scientific workshops and advisory meetings, um, which inform our strategic direction. Um, as the portfolio will be growing over the next, this next fiscal year, so will increase activities in our clinical and translational advisory panels or our CAPS and TAPS. And there, it's estimated that we will increase these activities by 57%, which also attributes to an increase in this budget category. And lastly, we anticipate that board and subcommittee activities will, will also increase during this fiscal year period. Um, again, um, most of these will occur virtually, but we do plan that there will be four um, board meetings with two of them at least being in person in this upcoming fiscal year. So I did wanna focus a little bit in on the um, reviews um, and meetings activities and, and provide a comparison um, to show a little bit why um, this cost has increased um, in this budget year. Um, historically, uh, this, this chart provides um, an, uh, an overview of our review activities since 2016. And historically, the primary drivers of review meeting, um, review meeting budgets has been the cost of hosting these meetings in person with um, the number of reviews and honoraria um, and, and with, with the variety of, of programs being offered. As you will see in 1617, the agency budget, budgeted for 17 reviews at um, about $1 million. And at this art time, the organization was offering a wide variety of programs and hosting all of its reviews in person, um, which included costs associated with offsite meeting rooms and travel and hotels for um, reviewers, along with honoraria. By the 1819 fiscal year, we began to operate and wind down and um, to reduce our administrative activities and overhead and conducted all of our in-person review meetings at our agency offices. Um, thus, you'll see a decrease in the budget for the, the, the budget for these 15 reviews conducted during that period. And by 2021, the agency was operating in a wind down, down mode with less reviews and all meetings were done virtually. Thus, there were limited program offerings focused only on our clinical and COVID rounds. And um, only, the only cost incurred for reviews at that time were in review or honoraria. Again, the 21-22 budget estimates 22 reviews at um, $751,000. 
And so just looking at the 21-22 budget compared to the 2021, um, the agency is doubling our number of reviews in this upcoming fiscal year, while the budget for 2022 has increased by 66%. And I thought it was important to, to explain to you why, what's driving this increase. Um, the primary drivers of, of, of this increase are honoraria, not as all of our meetings will be hosted, um, mostly virtually. But the honoraria is due to not just um, the amount, but it's it's also based on the number of reviews that a particular reviewer um, does in a, in a particular program area and the type of review. So as mentioned in 2021, we were limited due to research dollars in, in the variety of programs we could offer. And we only offered our COVID and clinical um, rounds, um, which involved fewer applications for review and our review meetings were just a shorter duration. In 21-22, um, our meeting schedule include our clinical reviews, which are monthly, but in addition, there will be reviews in our education portfolio, our discovery and translation program, and these all have higher application volumes, resulting in longer review meetings and require reviewers to review more applications per review, similar to the 16-17 period. Lastly, I wanted to turn to the final driver um, in the 2021-22 budget, which is facilities. Um, in 2019, the agency renegotiated a lease extension through March of 2022, as um, CIRM was operating an unknown with, um, with the upcoming November 2020 election. And um, we wanted to have offices to support either a wind down or wind up of agency activities. Um, so this increase began in early 2021, and this impacts our upcoming 21-22 budget. In addition, given, given that um, lease extension through March 2022, the organization's lease will be expiring in this fiscal year. And as the team is looking for the best option to accommodate our growing organization and allow us to best achieve our mission, um, we, we, we did want, we will be finalizing that decision over the next coming months, but this budget includes contingency funding to support either an office expansion at our current location and return to work or an office move, which includes um, leasing services, project management and um, mover expenses with a financial impact compared to the previous year of about $843,000. So finally, um, before, before I close my presentation and take questions, I did wanna highlight that um, you know, we, over the next uh, upcoming fiscal year, CERN will continue, continually manage costs and maintain expenses, but just wanna acknowledge that there are several factors that could affect our projected budget, which include, as mentioned, this, the current lease renewal or office move, um, our ongoing recruitment and personnel growth, and any um, unknowns related to COVID-19 that could uh, affect our meetings, um, travel, and uh, additional work activities. So at this time, the CERM team is requesting that the ICOC approve this proposed 21-22 um, fiscal year research, or sorry, administrative budget. And at this point, I will take any questions. Steve, would uh, would you uh, please comment as chair of the finance subcommittee? Sure, I'd be happy to, JT. So uh, um, this is just uh, yet uh, emblematic of the tremendous uh, improvement that's gone on within the finance <coughs> group over the years, uh, as I witnessed it. And uh, we, uh, Al Roulette and I started by pressure testing this budget uh, several weeks ago, and then the budget uh, subcommittee met and uh, reviewed the budget and approved it. Uh, and so I wanna thank Jennifer for, uh, for indulging us our questions over that period of time and for putting together what I think is a very well thought through uh, appropriate budget that I would highly recommend to uh, all of the ICOC members that are here and voting today. Thank you. Uh, before we get to any other comments or questions, do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. so moved. A second. Moved by Steve, seconded by Al. Uh, questions and comments from members of the board? I'd just like to echo Steve's comments. Uh, outstanding work, Jen, to you and your team uh, for comprehensively putting together a 
a great budgetary plan for the upcoming fiscal year. Thank you, JT. Any other comments from members of the board? Any comments from the public? There are no comments. Thank you. Maria, will you please call the roll? Dan Bernal, George Blumenthal. Yes. Linda Boxer. Allison Brashear. Yes. Leander Clark Harvey. Deborah Deese. Yes. Anne Marie Dulege. Yes. Isabel Dudon. Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. I think you're on mute, Fred. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Oh, it's okay, thank you. Elena Flowers, Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. An enthusiastic yes and thank you. Steve Julesgard. Yes. Joseph Kim. Yes. Pat Levitt. Yes. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. Shlomo Melmet. Yes. Christine Miskowski. Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan. Yes. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Al Roulette. Yes. Michael Stamos. Oz Stewart. Yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Christina Vori. Yes. Carol Watson. Yes. Keith Yamamoto. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, on to the next budget item, which is that of the scientific research budget for the fiscal year 21-22. Uh, Jennifer, please present here as well. Thank you, JT. Um, so just wanna make sure you could see my slides full screen. And hopefully we, I can make this quick because I understand we're probably bumping up to a break here. <laughs> um, so, um, so today I'll also be presenting to you the research budget um, for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, before I begin, um, I will share with you an overview of Prop 14, a high level overview just of the research allocation, particularly our annual allocation allowed under Proposition 14. Um, we will then review the January through June 2021 research budget and then um, the proposed research budget for the upcoming fiscal year, the major drivers, financial considerations, and the proposed budget. So before we discuss the current research budget, I would like to provide a brief overview of um, the research budget allocation under Prop 14. So Proposition 14 provides $5.5 in general obligation bond funding for CERM awards and administration. Of this, 4.9 billion is available for funding research awards, which of which is 99 million um, allocated to access and affordability funding. The proposition um, provides a maximum allocation for the annual research grant budget, um, which is for year one and year two, $517 million per year, plus an additional 10 10.5 million per year for access and affordability. It then stipulates years um, three through 10, um, we can um, uh, allocate 423 million per year, plus an additional 8.6 million per year for access and affordability. Um, and then there are also, as mentioned um, in the chair's report, specific um, allocations in the research budget um, um, of the 4.9 billion. Um, 1.38 billion is for diseases and conditions of the brain and central nervous system, 26 million for shared labs, and 78 million for community care centers. 
And just wanted to highlight this as you review the proposed budget as, um, as we're operating in the first few years, they, our maximum all annual allocation under Prop 14 is 517 million. And in an upcoming um, board meeting at the end of the year, along with the strategic plan, um, we will be providing a research and administrative forecast that shows the spend out under Prop 14 um, for this board to review and to become more familiar with. So um, first I wanted to provide a background on the current research budget um, from January through June, 2021. Um, as I mentioned in the administrative presentation, it, um, it was a unique year, but for the research budget, it's unique as it was a six month period. Um, in calendar year 2020, we um, were operating in a wind down with limited research dollars. Thus with the passage of Proposition 14, this ICOC approved a research budget in December of 2020 to reopen our core pillar programs in discovery, translational, and clinical, and then subsequently throughout the, the um, then um, approved additional um, concepts in the education infrastructure pillar. Um, also prior to 2021, um, it's important to note that the research budget had been allocated on a calendar year basis instead of fiscal year. So and in order to align the research budget with our administrative budget and the, Cal the state of California's budgeting calendar, this research budget will now be moved to a fiscal year period from July to June. Thus, the research budget approved in December of 2020 was again only a six month period from January through June 2021. So here is the allocated research budget for year one of Proposition 14 funding, which again is a shorter timeline of six months. Um, as you can see, 100 million was allocated to our clinical program, 60 million to translational, 22 million to our quest or, or just quest program, which falls under our discovery pillar of 22 million. Additionally, over this past six months, this board has been very busy meeting and approving additional concepts in our education pillar with our bridges and research training and spark awards um, that total 170.6 million and also included a supplement for our existing bridges programs, as well as a supplement for our alpha clinics um, in our infrastructure pillar of 3.4 million. Thus, the total research budget for this period of the six month period is $356 million. On this next slide, I will show the commitments to date. So this slide shows the approved allocation commitments through June 30th of this year and our estimated remaining balance. Um, the second column, as you can see, displays our estimated commitments through um, June 2021 of $44.7 million, which leaves a remaining balance of $311 million. Um, this remaining balance is significant, and it's due to a few factors. Um, the clinical program has had $26.3 million committed to date, um, which results in a, save, in, in, in a remaining balance of $73.6 million. Um, when this budget was approved, it was estimated under 12 clinical reviews under our monthly review cycle over a, a full year period. Um, however, when this was moved to a shortened timeline of six months, um, the, thus the committed awards didn't mature at the rate that we expected as, as the period shrank. Um, additionally, I just wanted to report that the application volume has been steady in this area as we've restarted our programs, but just not all the applications have made it through the full cycle and received a tier one recommendation coming to the board at this time. Um, similarly, in our translational program, the budget supported two reviews over a 12 month period um, with an increased ap application vo volume. Um, so we allocated 60 million. Um, as we anticipated that this program had not been offered since 2019, However, um, during this period, only one review um, occurred um, with three awards approved by this board in May, resulting in a balance of $45.5 million. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight um, due to the shorter budget period and the accelerated pace, which we relaunched our, our pillar programs and our education programs, there are several approved concepts that have funds allocated to them in this period, um, which are noted on the slide that will not come to this board for approval until the, the next um, fiscal year period. Um, those are in our, bridge, our Quest, Bridges, Research Training and Spark programs. Um, so these are noted as it, the, in the remaining balance column. However, it's important to note that these funds um, have not been realized, um, but they total about $192 million. Um, any remaining balance from any 
you know, these pillars um, will be available for future year research budget allocations for this board. So next I'm gonna to turn to the fiscal year 21-22 budget. Um, before I present the actual budget, I wanted to share the major drivers of this budget and considerations for this budget proposal. This budget anticipates increased reviews and the volume of applications for a 12 month period of 22 reviews. And it includes continued funding of our reoccurring program announcements in discovery, translation, and clinical. Um, the education budget includes funding for a conference grant concept, which allows for awards to be made um, to an existing non-CERM directed conference or provides an option for a CERM directed conference through a targeted RFA, um, such as a grantee meeting that we hosted in 2020. Um, the education budget also includes funds for a future training program concept for undergraduate students mentioned by Dr. Milan in her presentation that would come to this board for consideration later this fiscal year, um, along with a, a budget rationale with that concept. And similarly, a basic research concept, concept is being developed in our discovery program that will be brought to this board as well in the fall. And um, lastly, as mentioned, um, we will be bringing a revised 21-22 budget to the ICOC um, in December, in part in, in, along with the strategic plan, which would incorporate any new concepts in that plan that is approved by this board. So this, the next two slides summarize the financial considerations that support the proposed budget. Um, the clinical budget request of 162 million is based on several factors. Um, of the, it includes the maximum number of awards funded um, in, a, in, in a year um, and historically, along with the average award amount, um, as well as partnering that with the anticipated volume that we are seeing in our therapeutics team from their hunting efforts. And although that we cannot know how many applications will be scored favorably by the DWD, GWG, um, we have projected that this will be 15 awards and we think that that's achievable um, for our clinical stage projects or CLIN2 at 8.9 million per award. And for our late stage clinical preclinical projects or CLIN1, we have budgeted for six awards at 4.8 million per award. And again, both of these programs are offered on a monthly basis. The translational budget request of 52 million is based on the average number of awards funded per review along with the average award amount um, that, we, that we typically um, get in our applications in this program area, along with the anticipated volume. So um, given the stage of research and the most um, recent translational round that we, we conducted in 2021, the applications in the stage, um, many applications in this stage of development receive um, feedback from um, our reviewers and don't necessarily um, make it to um, the board for approval and, and have an opportunity to reapply. Um, thus, we, we are seeing that the, the volume is really um, falling within um, uh, our, our estimates of four awards per review. Um, and we'll be conducting three reviews over this period at an average award amount. Um, we are estimating at about 4.3 million per award. Um, our proposed discovery budget of 80 million um, includes funding for our quest program, our DIS2, and also a basic research concept that I mentioned. Um, the quest uh, program is the program announcement that re we received the highest demand historically. And in the most recent round in 2021, this is in line with um, the, the kind of trajectory we've seen in previous um, application rounds. Um, thus, we use the average number of awards funded per review as the benchmark for this, this, this program budget, um, lining that up for when we had full funding in our research budget for this program, along with estimating about a 20% increase. So um, for we're estimating about 15 awards per review and conducting two reviews um, during this upcoming fiscal year at, at an average dollar amount of 1.3 million per award. Um, we also have included funds in anticipation of the basic research concept that Dr. Milan mentioned um, that will come to the board later this year. Um, the proposed education budget is 66 million, and this includes the restart of the conference grant program that I mentioned with funds allocated of 1.2 million um, 
based on our historical analysis of this program um, over the past five years. And we've also included funds for an undergraduate training program that um, as mentioned is currently in development and will be coming to this board for consideration um, later this year. So here is the proposed current um, proposed research budget for 2021-22 alongside our current um, fiscal year budget. As mentioned, um, our current budget is 356 million. And, um, and I would like to highlight that the discovery and education programs, again, have applications that um, will um, be coming to this board and be committed in the 21-22 period, but these are not assumed in this proposed budget. Um, so the proposed 21-22 fiscal year budget includes a budget, again, for clinical of 162 million, not including our cure cure sickle cell allocation of 30 million, um, 52 million for our translational program, 80 million for discovery, 66 million for education, and um, no funds at this time for our infrastructure program for a total research budget of 360 million. And finally, before I end my presentation, I did wanna highlight um, for many of the new board members and those learning about our programs that our translational and clinical programs include requirements for co-funding, um, which leverage our, um, this board's investment and CIRM's investment ensures that awardees are also bringing additional funds to projects to move them forward. Thus, I wanted to just provide a high level table that shows that the maximum um, CIRM will provide funding for based, based on the program type, but also the type of award institution. And it also includes the required co-funding minimum for each of these program phases. And so just wanted you to keep that in mind as well as, as you're thinking this through. Um, and just for reference, under Proposition 71, um, $1.1 billion were committed in co-funding, required co-funding from our awardees of, the, of um, the 3 billion in research dollars that we deployed. So at this time, um, the CIRM team is requesting that the ICSC approve this proposed 21-22 fiscal year research budget of 360 million. And I can take any questions as well. Thank you, Jen. Uh, George? Yes, thank you. Sam, first of all, thank you for a very clear presentation on, on both budgets that you've just done. I think that's really helpful to the board. I have a very quick question for you. Uh, you mentioned that there's an annual limitation uh, based on the proposition in, in terms of what could be expended. It, the unused portion in any year, can that be moved to the following year to increase that year's allocation or must it be saved to the end? No, so we can, the remaining balance of those funds can be used in future fiscal years, whether that's the next fiscal year or, or um, future years down the line. Thank you. Okay, uh, Steve, do you have any further comments at this point? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I'm fine with, uh, again, this has been discussed before, and I think at the scientific uh, subcommittee, and uh, so I'm on board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Al, uh, do you have uh, any comments on this as the about to be incoming chair of finance? No, I uh, did all what uh, Steve said, and uh, this has been discussed thoroughly. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve? Uh, I'll move it. So moved. Uh, that was Al okay. and Dave, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Larry or Oz or Larry is heads of the science subcommittee. Do you have any comments on this portion of the budget? Uh, no, no, I don't. No. Oh. oh. Sorry. Go ahead, Oz. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't. Um, uh, we could, we could do a duet if you wanted. Uh, I, I think that this is uh, extremely well thought out, and um, uh, just you know, again, a reflection of extremely hard work by CERM staff, uh, thoughtful work in terms of where things need to go to. Uh, advance uh, treatments and cures for patients. So uh, it, it looks great to me. Thank you. I'll, I'll just echo what Oz said uh, and thank Jennifer for a very clear and valuable presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we hear a motion to approve this science budget? 
Is we have a motion, uh -huh. JT. Oh. It was by Al and Dave. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, uh, other further comments from members of the board. Hearing none, any public comment? There are no hands raised. Thank you. Maria, will you please call the roll? Dan Bernal, George Blumenthal? Yes. Linda Boxer? Yes. Al Thank you. Allison Brashear? Yep. Yes. Leonda Clark Harvey? Deborah Deese? Yes. Anne Marie Dulege? Isabel Dudon, Mark Fisher Colbury. Oh, Isabel, are you yeah. back? Yeah. Yes, I'm back. I didn't hear the discussion. I did read the report, so I will support, yes. <laughs> Thank you. And Anne-Marie, I see you, but you're on mute. So I don't know if you've just stepped out for a moment. So okay, uh, Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. Yes. Elena Flowers, Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. Yes. Steve Julesgard. Yes. Joseph Kim. Yes. Pat Levitt. Yes. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. Shlomo Melmed. Yes. Christine Miaskowski. Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan. Yes. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Al Roulette. Yes. Michael Stamos. Yes. Oz Stewart. Sorry, yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Christina Vori. Yes. Carol Watson. I'm going to go back to, is Anne-Marie back on the line? And Carol. Okay. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Maria. And, and Oz, I think a duet in the future would be an excellent idea. So perhaps you guys can sort of work on that. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to take a break. It's 12.01. Uh, we'd like to, if we could, do a 15-minute break to allow you to get your lunch. Uh, and we will resume promptly at 12.16 with the balance of the agenda. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We can reconvene at this point. Uh, we are continuing with the action items. Start with number nine, consideration of amendments to the clinical translation and discovery stage concept plans. Uh, Dr. Sombrano will be presenting. Bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna share my screen. Just give me one moment. Start the presentation here. Okay. <clears throat> so good afternoon. So uh, just a little background on these uh, concept amendments. Um, as was mentioned earlier in December, the uh, board considered and approved changes to the discovery, translational, and clinical concepts to allow us to relaunch these core programs starting January 2021 under Prop 14. And so at this time, we're bringing some additional changes uh, just to ensure some consistency among these concepts, uh, basically some, some cleanup, and to remove some unnecessary barriers to applicants that we've identified. Uh, but later this year, we're going to uh, be bringing additional and more comprehensive changes that will align the concepts with the new strategic plan draft that we will bring at that time as well. Um, so I want to go over in, in uh, the next few slides what is perhaps the, the more significant or uh, comprehensive change in these concepts that we're bringing to you. Um, so I'll start with just the language in Prop 71 that was carried over to Prop 14 as well. And so this is a, a specific requirement that states in order to ensure that institute funding, meaning CERM, does not duplicate or supplant existing funding, a high priority shall be placed on funding pluripotent stem cell and progenitor cell research that cannot or is unlikely to receive timely or sufficient federal funding, unencumbered by limitations that would impede the research. And so in this regard, other research categories funded by the NIH shall not be funded by the institute unless such research timing is funding is not timely or sufficient. And so the timely or sufficient is, is sort of the, the operative and critical elements here. And we discussed this to some extent at the March board meeting um, in terms of how CERM has, has dealt with it and uh, possible ways of, of uh, um, dealing with it going forward. So uh, the way we have done it up until now is we have had language um, in the eligibility requirements of the RFA or program announcement uh, that is akin to whatever the eligibility of the candidate would be, that it also is being developed for a rare unmet need, unlikely to receive funding from other sources. And so this unlikely to receive funding from other sources has been difficult for either CERM uh, or the grants working group to assess in an objective or meaningful way on an application by application basis. And so our proposal for resolving this is to basically have this determination um, made at the concept level. Um, and so our argument is, is as follows. Um, although NIH provides funding in many areas in which CERM is active, such funding is not timely or sufficient until really there is a widely available treatment or cure. So CIRM's value proposition is to accelerate the delivery of treatments and cures through targeted funding uh, and active award management, including providing ongoing expertise and resources to awardees. So therefore we propose that the ICOC uh, determine via the concept approval that the proposed concept plan satisfies this requirement by providing funding and other resources that help promote the, the faster, more um, efficacious result in the absence of certain funding. Um, okay, and so this here is just a, an example of the text uh, you have, uh, I think, in the materials provided the um, edits or proposed changes for the discovery translation on clinical uh, concepts. And so this is just the example taken out of the, the CLIN1 uh, concepts uh, and what the language looks like in terms of just stressing that um, the CLIN program in this example 
uh, is one of our programs that continues to um, offer an opportunity for the types and stages of clinical research that otherwise do not exist or of, are of limited scope and focus to advance the field of regenerative medicine. Uh, we go on to say that the federal funding has um, limitations for a variety of reasons, including uh, that um, many of those uh, offerings are primarily driven by internal priorities and interests of the administering body. They um, are often unpredictable and limited in scope and focus. And so the CLIN-1 program as one example, um, and it's true for uh, our core uh, product development programs, uh, are, are different from other funding sources. They provide reliable and predictable funding throughout the award period. And that is because we don't rely on an annual allocation for already existing awards. The commitments are made up front. And so once that commitment is made, the funding is available uh, for that award uh, and, and during the entire period of it. Um, we also bring to bear uh, expert term staff and advice to support accelerated outcomes and advancements of the projects along those stages of development. And so there, you know, examples of this are the um, clinical advisory panels, the, uh, the translational advisory panels, the um, ongoing guidance that term science officers provide to the projects, um, and also the way we uh, structure these opportunities so that each of them is striving to and achieves a clear um, outcome that is going to allow them to go to the next stage. So for example, for a, a, a TRAN, it is getting to a pre-IND meeting. For a CLIN-1, is submitting the IND and so on. And so CERM provides then this unique opportunity to California scientists <clears throat> to support stages in the development of clinical in this case, Plan 1, research projects that are unlikely to receive timely or sufficient funding from other sources. <clears throat> and so we are going to add um, this statement uh, and or um, uh, vary just uh, to tailor them to each of the concepts to address how those programs provide that unique opportunity uh, in those concept documents. And then correspondingly, we're going to remove statements in the eligibility section that would require applicants to demonstrate that they are unlikely to receive timely or sufficient funding from other sources. Um, so that's that um, change. And then just very quickly, I'll go over um, some of the other global changes that we are proposing. Uh, we are continuing to broadly include gene therapy projects as in scope for certain funding. We did that already for the um, therapeutic candidates, but we're now including it for the diagnostic device and tool projects uh, in all of these different concepts. We are removing an eligibility requirement that small molecule or biologic proposals had to involve a therapeutic candidate that was previously funded by CIRM. This was a requirement that was inserted um, in the last couple of years uh, under Prop 71 as funds were becoming more limited, we wanted to focus our efforts on cell therapy. Uh, and so we uh, thought at that time that if a small molecule or biologic proposal comes to us, it would have to be one that we have already supported. Uh, I think where we are now, we're, we're ready to uh, reopen things to any small molecule or biologic coming our way, uh, not necessarily just the ones we've proposed in the past. We are also making some minor clarifications in adding regenerative medicine, uh, or at least the term regenerative medicine, uh, to help broadly describe the scope of CIRM funding. And then uh, next are some of the proposed changes to each of these that are more specific. So for the DIS2 program, there really isn't uh, very much there other than some minor clarifications in the description of eligible gene therapy candidates. We noticed uh, some language that uh, we thought might be confusing, uh, and so we uh, <clears throat> made some corrections there. For the translational concept, uh, we are um, proposing a change in the project manager percent effort requirement 
to 50%. Previously, uh, it has been 35%. And this is just from uh, our experience in uh, with uh, uh, grantees and kind of what uh, has been felt is, is an appropriate uh, amount for the project manager involvement in these projects. Um, addition also of gene therapy to the scope of the diagnostic medical device and tools, as I mentioned before, um, in these TRAN programs. Finally, in the clinical program, <clears throat> uh, a change in time to IND filing in the CLIN1 program. Uh, changing that from 18 to 24 months. Again, this is from uh, ongoing experience with existing CLIN 1 projects. We thought that 24 months is a more uh, realistic and practical uh, time frame for them to achieve uh, the IND filing. We are changing the percent effort requirement for the project manager to 50% here as well. Uh, it was previously 75%, and that would actually make um, the project manager requirement 50% across the board. So it, it makes it consistent to, for uh, all stages. And then we are removing a, a specific preference for rare or pediatric indications that was limited to phase three trials. Um, we you know, typically don't get uh, many phase three trial proposals coming our way. And certainly um, we are always open for rare or pediatric indications, but we found that it wasn't necessarily um, producing any specific benefit. Uh, and so we thought it was just prudent to, to remove that as it wasn't really serving any specific uh, purpose. And there was no reason for it to be different than phase one or phase twos. And so these, this is a summary of, of the changes that are proposed. And so uh, we are requesting ICOC approval of these proposed amendments uh, to the DISC, TRAN, and CLIN concept plans as uh, is provided and shown in the edits in the um, concept plans provided. So thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gil. Uh, this is obviously a, a nuts and bolts sort of action item here, which uh, these uh, all of these concept plans tend to get revised uh, periodically is new data informs how the programs are working, et cetera. And so this is a very necessary move. So thank you, Gil. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Larry. Second. Seconded by Anne Marie. Is there any questions or comments from the board? Any comments from the public? There are no hands raised. Hearing none, Maria, will you please call the roll? Dan Bernal. George Blumenthal? Yes. Linda Boxer? Yes. Allison Brashear? Yes. Leandra Clark Harvey? Deborah Deese? Anne Marie Dulege? Yes. Isabel Dudon? Yes. Mark Fisher Colbury? Yes. Fred Fisher? Elena Flowers, Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. Yes. Steve Jules Gard. Yes. Joseph Kim. Pat Levitt. Yes. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Dave. Shlomo Malmed. Yes. Christine Miaskowski? Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan? Yes. Adriana Padilla? Yes. Joe Panetta? Yes. Al Roulette? Yes. Michael Stamos? Yes. Oz Stewart? Yes. Jonathan Thomas? Yes. Art Torres? Aye. <clears throat> Christina Vori? Yes. Carol Watson? Yes. Keith Yamamoto. The motion carries. Thank you, Maria. On to item 10, consideration of new appointments and reappointments to the GWG, Dr. Sombrano. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're bringing for your consideration some nominations 
uh, uh, for appointment for new members to the grants working group, as well as some reappointment of um, old members. Um, and so the new appointments include, and we provided this in the bios that were in the materials. There are five new appointments, and these include uh, Christopher Bono, who is a professor of orthopedic surgery at Harvard Medical School, uh, Zhao Jun, or Lance Lian, who's an associate professor of biology and biomedical engineering at Pennsylvania State University, uh, Leon Leonid uh, Metalitsa, who's a professor at Baylor College of Medicine. Elias Sayer, who is an associate professor of Sur neurosurgery and pediatrics at the University of Florida. And Dr. Monica S. Thacker, who is an associate professor at the Fred, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Um, we also, for reappointments, have 19 members who we are uh, providing a we provided a table with a proposed uh, number of years for their second and or third terms. And uh, I'm not gonna list all their names, but they are available there and happy to any, answer any questions about these candidates. Thank you, Gil. Do we hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, I'm sorry, who were the first and second? I didn't catch that at all. Yeah, Mark, Mark Fisher Colbury for the first. Oh, thank you, Mark. Great. Judy Gasson for the second. Thanks, Judy. <clears throat> Any comments or questions of Gil from members of the board? Hi, Jay, hi, hi JT, it's Pat. I, is, is there, I, as a new member, is, is there a, a, a cap on the number of members? And is, is this, are these additions sufficient for what, what I gathered from the budget review is a expectation of a significant increase in applications and reviews that are going to be required. Yes, no, that's a great question. There, there is no cap. So the way we do this, we try to maintain as large of a pool as possible of members. So it, it's usually between two, two to 300 that we can draw from in order to assemble a panel of 15 grants working group members for any given uh, review. And so, you know, depending on the, the type of uh, projects, we will um, assemble the appropriate panel based on that. Um, and so, yes, a, a lot of the uh, members that we are bringing in are in anticipation of uh, reviews that we are going to have later this year that uh, go into the basic biology and education programs in particular. Thanks. Larry? Yeah, I should remember this, but I, but I seem to have forgotten. Uh, with new people, uh, do they come in in some sort of trial period where you evaluate, you know, do they work well with others? Are their judgments sound, et cetera, Gil? Yeah, so, um, so we, we do that to the extent possible. Sometimes if it's not, um, we prefer to have them um, come in as a specialist reviewer. So as a specialist, they're not a member of the GWG, but they lend their expertise to a review. They don't score or vote, but it's an opportunity for us to see how well they do, uh, to determine whether they uh, complete assignments uh, and you know just generally what their expertise appears to be. So uh, where we can, we um, um, have them participate at least uh, a couple of times as a specialist. And so many of the folks proposed here have done that. Uh, and then at that point, we uh, propose these names uh, to the leadership team to uh, give us their input and comments. So often they uh, are involved in, and witness the, the reviews and, and may have opinions about this as well. So we do try to uh, have as thorough of an assessment before we bring them on as GWG members. Terrific, thank you. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Any public comment? Hearing none, Maria, will you please call the roll? Dan Bernal, George Blumenthal? Yes. Linda Boxer? Yes. Allison Brashear? Yes. Leander Clark Harvey? Deborah Deese? 
Anne Marie Dulage. Yes. Isabel Dudon. Yes. Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. Yes. Elena Flowers. Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. Yes. Steve Jules Guard. Yes. Joseph Kim. Pat Levitt. Yes. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. Shlomo Melmed. Yes. Christine Miskowski. Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan. Yes. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Al Roulette. Yes. Michael Stamos. Yes. Oz uh, Stewart. Yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Christina Vori. Yes. Carol Watson. Yes. Keith Yamamoto. The motion carries. Thank you, Maria. Uh, on to the next item, number 11. Uh, when I was going through my uh, review and recitation of board activity over the last eight months, uh, one of the specific activities which I left for this item was uh, the involvement in, given that the board is even larger than it was before uh, in the subcommittee structure. And so the next item is going to be a review of the leadership positions and the membership of each of the subcommittees and Maria Bonneville will be presenting. Thank you. JT, um, and thank you to all the board members who have agreed to be on leadership positions, some of whom I strong armed. So I appreciate, um, I appreciate you guys um, doing this for me and for the board and the group. So we have the following subcommittees, the application review subcommittee, the communication subcommittee, the finance subcommittee, governance, IP and industry and science. The application review subcommittee is a set committee. Um, all board members are part of the committee, although the following are voting members, the ones you see on your screen. The others are ex officio. So this is set um, in stone and it's comprised of our patient advocates, nurse members, members of industry, and the chair and vice chair. The next committee, the communications subcommittee, Isabel Dudon and Pat Levitt have agreed to chair and co-chair that committee. In addition, we have George Blumenthal, Allison Brashear, Mark Fisher Colbury, Larry Goldstein, Leandra Clark Harvey, David Higgins, Linda Malkus, Lauren Miller Rogan, Jonathan Thomas, and Art Torres. Finance, Al Rolette has agreed to chair. We have Haifa Abdulak, Linda Boxer, Anne Marie Dulege, Steve Julesgard, Shlomo Melmed. Christine Miaskowski, Joe Panetta, Michael Stamos, Jonathan Thomas, Art Toros, and Christina Voris, Christina Vori sitting on this committee. For governance, we have Judy Gasson and Christina Vori who have agreed to chair and co-chair this committee. Um, on the committee is Dan Bernal, George Blumenthal, Linda Boxer, Allison Brashear, Elena Flowers, Steve Julesgard, Linda Malkus, Adriana Padilla, Oz Stewart, Jonathan Thomas, and Art Torres. The IP and industry subcommittee will be chaired by Steve Julesgard and Keith Yamamoto. On that committee, Allison Brashear, Anne Marie Dulege, Larry Goldstein, Dave Martin, Shlomo Melmed, Joe Panetta, Michael Stamos, Jonathan Thomas, Art Torres, and Carol Watson. For science, Larry Goldstein will be our chair. On that committee, Haifa Abdulak, Deborah Deese, Mark Fisher Colbury, Elena Flowers, Judy Gasson, David Higgins, Pat Levitt, Dave Martin, Shlomo Melmed, Christine Miaskowski, Oz Stewart, Jonathan Thomas, Art Torres, mm. Christina Vori, Carol Watson, and Keith Yamamoto. And that is all. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Maria. And uh, before we get to any vote on this, I just want to echo what uh, Senator Torres said earlier about Maria uh, and about how uh, for the, the 10 years now, it's hard to believe that I've been chair of the board, uh, that she has been an 
absolutely indispensable right-hand person to both Art and me, and uh, a great friend uh, to all members of the board and has been absolutely central to the board's success in what it has done over all these years. Uh, so uh, Maria, thank you for all that. Oh, thank you, JT, I appreciate that. Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, do I hear a motion that we approve and the item is actually not the membership, it's the leadership as listed on the slides of the respective subcommittees. So moved. Moved by Mr. Jules Gard. I'll second it. Seconded by I'll Dr. Second Martin. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any questions or comments about the subcommittees or the subcommittee structure or anything related to the subcommittees? Okay, hearing none, I will just simply say that they, uh, given that the board is, is a, a large board, uh, this will be uh, critical uh, to the success of the agency going forward uh, as it has been in the past, but perhaps now more than ever. So I second Maria's comment. Uh, thank you for uh, your willingness to serve, whether it's as chair, co-chair, or member of each of the subcommittees. Do we have uh, any comments from members of the public? Thank you. Hearing none, Maria, will you please call the roll? Dan Bernal, George Blumenthal. Yes. Linda Boxer. Yes. Allison Brashear. Yes. Leander Clark Harvey. Deborah Deese. Yes. Anne Marie Dulege. Yes. Isabel Dudon. Yes. Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. Yes. Elena Flowers, Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. Yes. Steve Julesgard. Yes. Joseph Kim, Pat Levitt. Yes. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. Shlomo Melmed. Yes. Christine Miaskowski. Yes. Laura Miller Rogan. Yes. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Al Roulette. Yes. Michael Stamos. Yes. Oz Stewart. Yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Christina Vori. Yes. Carol Watson. Yes. Keith Yamamoto. The motion carries. Thank you, Maria. On to item 13, which uh, is one of the longer titles for an item, uh, I will read. Consideration of delegation of authority for the negotiation and execution of a lease for new office space in the Bay Area, along with the negotiation and execution of other contracts necessary for CIRM's relocation to the CIRM president in consultation with the chair and vice chair of the board. Senator Torres will lead discussion on this item. I ask for an I vote. It's pretty uh, self-evident uh, uh, within this short memo of what we're trying to do. And that just authorizes uh, us to work together with Maria and also with outside sources. I believe Kevin Marks, our general counsel, will be the point person on this endeavor. So I ask for an I vote. Thank you, Art. That explanation was shorter than the actual item itself is listed yes. on the agenda. It's very nicely done. <laughs> uh, do we hear any questions or comments uh, from members of the board? Uh, I should say that uh, uh, as Jen noted, the our lease expires in March of 22 uh, and uh, that necessitates us uh, in very short order as we have already been doing as led by Dr. Milan and the team uh, and Senator Torres uh, overseeing uh, the, uh, the options that we have uh, which would obviously include extension of where we are or relocation to other parts of the Bay Area. So th this is, is critical, requires uh, specific ongoing immediate attention from Dr. Milan. And uh, so that's the purpose of this item. Any questions or comments? Move it. 
been moved or second? Second. Second. Okay. Uh, any any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, I'll just note that we're in extremely capable hands in this negotiation of Dr. Milan handling this. Uh, so uh, any public comment? Hearing none, Maria, will you please call the roll? Ann Bernal, George Blumenthal. Yes. Linda Boxer. Yes. Allison Brashear. Yes. Leander Clark Harvey. Deborah Deese. Yes. Henry, thank you, Deborah. Henri Dulege. Yes. Isabel Dudon. Yes. Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. Yes. Elena Flowers, Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. Yes. Steve Julesgard. Yes. Joseph Kim, Pat Levitt. Yes. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. Shlomo Melmed. Yes. Christine Miaskowski. Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Al Roulette. Yes. Michael Stamos. Yes. Oz Stewart. Yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Christina Vori. Yes. Carol Watson. Keith Yamamoto. The motion carries. Thank you, Maria. Uh, item 14, consideration of support for CASV 247, the so-called Rare Disease Advocacy Council Act. Uh, Senator Torres on this item as well. Art? Yes, uh, this bill is sponsored by Senator uh, Talamantes Eggman from Stockton. She has been working very hard with uh, rare disease patient advocates. Uh, they were very much part of our effort uh, during the campaign as well because they were very uh, hard working and reaching out to people on, on this issue. We would be joining uh, probably uh, 17 other states uh, that have already adopted a rare disease advisory council which is created uh, with the state and it would basically try to address the issues of rare diseases and coordination with, uh, with families. We've, uh, we've given uh, support to many of these, uh, not many, but some of these rare disease uh, uh, projects. And it's already passed the assembly of the Senate and is moving to the assembly for approval sometime later between now and, and September. And it would ba basically act, act as a unified, for unified force of California state government on what ought to be done with rare diseases, not the least of which a role we could play, but also the Department of Public Health uh, could play, and also uh, educating lawmakers about these uh, diseases. Right now, uh, the states are cited in the memo that I sent to each of you, and we already fund research uh, in these areas, as I said, uh, immunodeficiency, retina pigmentosa, sickle cell, uh, and also uh, uh, cystinosis, which we've also uh, sponsored in the past. So. These are uh, wonderful people who are working very, very hard in this area on behalf of uh, patients. I ask for an I vote. Thank you, Art. Do we hear a motion? Move it. Move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, it sounds uh, obviously like a, a very excellent thing to be doing. Uh, are there any comments or questions by members of the board, Larry? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a terrific idea. I just would love to know from Senator Torres, is there any anticipated downside to doing this? It just sounds like a, a clean play. No, no downside as has been experienced in other states. Uh, I might also add that the governor is okay. He was assaulted pretty severely yesterday. Thank God the state police intervened and arrested the individual. But he and I talked this morning about this legislation uh, and it's it's basically to create this council, which uh, obviously he supports, but also as we move forward to the assembly, it looks like it had no opposition in the Senate. And I anticipate the same in the assembly and I anticipate the governor signing the bill. Great, thank you. 
Allison. So um, I'm in support of this as a neurologist who encounters lots of rare diseases. Um, I think this gives us a great way to be inclusive and have um, new rare diseases be brought forth. So uh, lots of support. Thank you, Dean. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Any public comment? Hearing none, Maria, will you please call the roll? Dan Bernal, George Blumenthal? Yes. Linda Bach, sir? Yes. Allison Brashear? Yes. Leander Clark Harvey? Yes. Deborah Deese? Yes. Yeah. Anne Marie Dulege. Yes. Isabel Duran. Yes. Mark Fisher Colbury. Yes. Fred Fisher. Yes. Elena Flowers. Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. David Higgins. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Steve Julesgard. Yes. Joseph Kim. Pat Levitt. Sorry. Sorry. Pat, yes. Oh, yes. It, it's, thank you. Linda Malkus. Yes. Dave Martin. Yes. Shlomo Melmed. Yes. Christine Miskowski. Yes. Lauren Miller Rogan. Adriana Padilla. Yes. Joe Panetta. Yes. Al Roulette. Yes. Michael Stamos. Yes. Oz Stewart. Yes. Jonathan Thomas. Yes. Art Torres. Aye. Christina Vori. Yes. Carol Watson. Keith Yamamoto. The motion carries. Thank you, Maria. That concludes the action items. We have one discussion item, uh, which is from time to time, we get some donations to CIRM from members of the public for which we are always very grateful. And uh, Pune, would you uh, care to comment on these at this time, please? Good afternoon, chairman and board members. Thank you for the warm welcome earlier today. In fiscal year 2021, CIRM received three donations totaling $200. All of them were in memory of Mr. Tom Howie. And that concludes the donation report. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so that uh, concludes the open part of the agenda. We are now going to proceed into closed session. I'm going to turn it over to uh, James Harrison's partner, Ben Gerverser, who's going to read the relevant language that will send us off into closed session, and then uh, we will uh, proceed from there. Ben? Thank you, JT. The board's gonna convene in closed session to discuss the evaluation of the president pursuant to government code section 11126 subdivision A and health and safety code section 1252930 subdivision F3D. Okay, thank so you. So what we'll do now, yeah, what we'll do now is I'm going to be placing you in a breakout room um, and then uh, JT, I'll give you, um, I'll send you a text when it's, when it's good to start. I just want to make sure that you are indeed in, um, in a private closed session. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to attempt this. It worked last time. We'll see.
does this mean I get to stay here with you, Maria? <laughs> um, you should have received an invite and then just accept it, Isabel okay. and David. I'm not seeing it then. Okay. Um, let me hold on. Let me assign you. Okay. See. Oh, there you. How go. How about now? No. Okay, great.
Maria, are you still there? Hello. Team, did you guys all go out to lunch? Hey, Maria, we're still live on YouTube. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we're here. We're just waiting for them to come back. And then we will end the meeting once they come back from closed session. Okay, good. Look, look who's here. Who's here? <laughs> I know. Hey, can you guys all come? Oh, you don't have to social distance anymore, right? No. Come in. Not... I want to take a picture. You want to take a picture, everyone? Or you can. Yes, we're on in. YouTube. Just we're gonna take a picture. No, but I wanted of you guys together. Like we'll in do one that. Frame. Come on over. It's a my. It's the evolution of um remote, so that. <laughs> there they are. There they are. Where's okay? Where's Ben? And where's Doug? Oh, there you guys. Oh, Coley. Oh my gosh. There's my team. I love you guys.
didn't even have to get on it. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're Hello. back. <laughs> ben, I think you have something to report. Great. Yeah, let me make sure everyone's in. But our formal report from closed session is that we have nothing to report. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Ben, for your help and standing in on James' behalf. You made him uh, proud, Ben. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, uh, we are now to the very tail end of the meeting. Uh, is there any public comment on any topic of any interest? I don't see any um, hands raised. Okay, hearing none, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Maria and Doug and Coley and everybody who helped with the logistics of making this meeting happen. Uh, uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, it, it's uh, Things are looking very good other than the inexplicable fact that the Giants are in first place at the moment, but we won't discuss that in any detail. Uh, and I would like to note that, uh, as usual, Maria has, has sent me a number of texts along the way. Most were rather <laughs> mundane. Uh, probably the most interesting was uh, before the meeting when she sent me an article about Jimmy Smith's role in In the Heights and what a big <laughs> fan of Jimmy Smith she is. <laughs> it was a great movie. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Smith was part of my cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> Maria and I, by the way, we discovered today, even though it came out over the weekend, have both seen it twice already. And uh, if, for those who haven't seen it, it is just outstanding and highly recommended by your two film critics here on the on on screen. You can, so, you can add my son that texted me an enthusiastic endorsement today, which he rarely does. It, it's just like it's two and a half hours long. You could easily do another two and a half and never tire of it. It's just fantastic. Uh, anyway, uh, any other comments by members of the board on anything at this point? Bonneville and Thomas, that has a nice ring to it. We could get a TV show around that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. We'll add that to the, uh, the, the Stuart Goldstein duet. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, well, listen, thank you, everybody. It's been a, a lengthy agenda. We accomplished a lot. Have a happy wonderful fourth. Happy fourth. Thank you, Art. Have a wonderful summer. Uh, we will see the uh, application review subcommittee in July and monthly thereafter in the full board in October. So, uh, with that, we stand adjourned.